and welcome to the Metropolitan Area and Planning Commission meeting for October 6th. I would like to call this meeting to order and ask for the introductory recording, please. Before we begin the agenda, Wichita Sedgwick County Metropolitan Area Planning Committee and the Wichita Sedgwick County Board of Zoning Appeals would like to take this opportunity to welcome everyone to this public hearing. For those in attendance, copies of the agenda for today's meeting, the public hearing procedure, and planning department staff reports on all agenda items are available in the lobby. The Planning Commission's and the BZA's bylaws limit the applicant on a zoning, subdivision, or variance application and his or her representatives to a total of 10 minutes of speaking time at the start of the hearing on that item, plus up to two minutes at the conclusion of that hearing. All other persons wishing to speak on agenda items are limited to three minutes per person. However, if they feel that it is needed and justified, the chairman may extend these times by up to two minutes. All speakers are requested to state his or her name and address for the record when beginning to speak. When you are finished speaking, please share your name, address, and the case number on the sheet provided in the room. This will enable staff to notify you if there are any additional proceedings concerning that item. All speakers at the podium, please remove your face mask before speaking into the microphone. Please note that all written and visual materials you present to the commission and the board will be retained by the secretary as part of the official record. If you are not speaking, but you wish to be notified about future proceedings on a particular case, please provide your contact information to the planning department. The Planning Commission and the Board are interested in hearing the views of all persons who wish to express themselves on all the agenda items. However, we ask that all speakers please be as courteous and concise as possible and avoid long repetitions of facts or opinions which have already been stated. For your information, the Wichita City Council has adopted a policy for all city zoning items. A copy of this policy is available from the planning staff. The City Council relies on a written record of the Planning Commission hearings and does not conduct its own additional public hearings on these items. The decision of the BZA is final. Any appeal of a decision of the BZA is to the District Court. Thank you. Can we now have the roll call of Commissioners present, please? Yes, ma'am. Fox? Present. Duell. Here. McKay. Here. Green. Here. Bill Johnson. Here. Blick. Here. Nix. Here. Foster. Here. Warren. Here. Joe Johnson. Here. Miles. Here. Hartman is absent. Cunningham. Here. Williams Bay. Here. Ma'am, I show three, 13 members present, one absent. Thank you. I would entertain a motion for the September 15th meeting minutes, and I note that Chuck Warren was absent. Move that we approve. Motion from Commissioner Green. Second. Second, Second. Commissioner Foster. All in favor of accepting the minutes as written, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, thank you. Those opposed, nay. Hearing none, one abstention. Motion passes 12 one, zero, 1. We'll now proceed through the agenda items for today's meeting. After each, I'll find out if anyone would like to hear the case or if it can be taken on consent. First item, subdivision 2022 0049 Pike 4th edition. Do any commissioners present or virtual want to hear this case? Does any member of the public want present want to hear this case? Pike 4th edition. Hearing none, 
Any uh, public members for participating virtually want to hear this case? Hearing none, we'll take that item on consent. Move to approve. Motion by Commissioner Miles. Second. Second by Commissioner McKay. Any discussion? All in favor, aye. 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 Any opposed, nay? 2.1 passes. Vacation item 2022 000 27 54 and South Bonanza Circle. Anyone on the commission, virtual or present, want to hear this case? Anyone, member of the public, want to hear this case? Anyone participating virtually want to hear this case? We'll take that item on consent. Item 3.2, vacation item 2022-00028 at 39th North and Webb Road. Anyone on the commission want to hear this case? Anyone present from the public want to hear this case? Anyone virtual want to hear this case? Hearing none, we'll take 3.2 on consent. Item 3.3. Vacation item 2022 K96 and North Hoover Road. Does anyone on the commission want to hear this case? Anyone from the public virtually want to hear this case? Anyone from the public present want to hear this case? 3.3 will be taken on consent. Item 3.4, vacation item 2022 30 North Ridge Road and 37th Street North. Does anyone on the commission want to hear this case? Anyone from the public want to hear this case? Anyone participating virtually want to hear this case? 3.4 on consent. I would entertain a motion from the commission. Move to approve items 3.1 through 3.4 for staff comments. Second. Motion from Commissioner Foster, second Commissioner Green. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by aye. 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 Any opposed, nay? Motion passes 13 0. Public hearing items 4.1 conditional use 2022 0032. East Central Avenue and Woodlawn. Does anyone on the commission want to hear this case? Anyone from the public want to hear this case? Anyone participating virtually want to hear this case? 4.1 will be taken on consent. Item 4.2, conditional use 2022 0033, um, West 21st Street and Tyler Road. Does anyone on the commission want to hear this case? Yes. Okay, we will hear that case. Item 4.3, conditional use 2022 0034, uh, North Hydraulic and 37th Street North. Does anyone on the commission want to hear this case? Yes. Okay, we will hear that case. Item 4.4, uh, conditional use 2022 0036 at Hydraulic and 79th Street South. We will hear that case. Is the agent present? Okay. I also need to check, is the agent present for uh, conditional use 2022 0034? Okay. And uh, agent present for Tyler Road and West 21st Street? Okay. Thank you. Um, we will also hear item 4.5, which is condition, um, community unit plan 2022 0041 at 21st and Webb Road. Does anyone in the commission want to hear community unit plan 2022 0042 at Central and Edgemore? Anyone in the commission want to hear that one? Anyone from the public want to hear that item? Anyone participating virtually want to hear that item? Community unit, community unit plan 2022 0042. Right. 
Thank you. Okay, I think, staff, can you clarify what you heard? Looking at the online system, it looks like we were getting some noise okay. from caller number five. It appeared that they did not know that they didn't have their phone muted. Okay. So we will take item 4.6 on consent. Item 4.7, community unit plan 2022 0044 at 21st North and Greenwich Road. Uh, does anyone on the commission want to hear this case? Yes, that's 4.7, we will hear. Zoning case 2022, 0040 has been withdrawn by the applicant. Item 4.9, zoning case 2022, 0045 at Seneca and Harry. Anyone on the commission want to hear that case? Anyone from the public want to hear that case? Anyone participating virtually want to hear that case? We will take 4.9 on consent. 4.10 zoning case 2022 0046 and conditional use 2022 0035. We will hear that case. Item 4.11, zoning case 2022 0047 at Douglas and Seneca. Does anyone on the commission want to hear that case? Anyone from the public present want to hear that case? Anyone participating virtually want to hear that case? We will take that item on consent. Madam Chair, I'm sorry, on 4.10, Pardon me? On 4.10, could you inquire whether the agent or applicant's here? Oh, 4.10, I'm sorry, thank you. Uh, do we have an agent or applicant for item 4.10? East 13th and Hillside. Madam Chair, he's online. Okay, thank you for the prompt as well. Uh, 4.11 will be on consent. 4.12, zoning case 2022 0048 and community unit plan 2022 0043, K96 near Shannon Woods Circle. Uh, does anyone on the commission want to hear that case? Does anyone from the public want to hear that case? Anyone participating virtually want to hear that case? Yes. We will hear that case. That was 4.12. 4. 4. 4, 4. Oh, is the agent or applicant for that case present? Out in the hallway. Thank you. Zoning case 2022 0049 at 39th Street and Rock Road. Does anyone on the commission want to hear this case? Anyone present from the public want to hear this case? Anyone what, just... What was it after? This is zoning case 2022, 0049, uh, near 39th South and South Rock Road. Yes. The, is, uh, will 3636 South Rock Road fall, fall under that? Yes, it would. Yes, I need to hear that, please. Okay, we'll hear 4.13. Agent or applicant present? Yep. All right, you need to be a little louder out there, thank you. Um, zoning case 2022, 0050, uh, near Greenwich and East Harry. Does anyone on the commission want to hear that case? Anyone from the public want to hear that case? Anyone participating virtually want to hear that case? Yes. Okay, we will hear 4.14. Agent or applicant? I'm going to get this by the end of this meeting. Thank you.
Item 4.15, zoning case 2022-00051, and West Burton and South Meridian. Does anyone on the commission want to hear this case? Anyone from the public want to hear this case? Anyone participating virtually want to hear, hear this case? Hearing none, we'll take that item on consent. I'd like to move that we um, approve 4.1, 4.6, 4.9, 4.11, and 4.15 per staff comments. I have a motion from Commissioner Foster, second from Commissioner Warren. Any discussion from the commission? Hearing none, all in favor, aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. Motion passes 13-0. Because we have a BZA item contingent upon the, the findings of this meeting, we will proceed with um, hearing cases on our uh, planning commission meeting until we get through the affected item that's impacting both. So, our first item to hear, anybody can help me out? Okay, 4.2, uh, condition use 2022 Christina. Good afternoon, everyone. Christina Reed, Associate Planner with the Planning Department. Um, we have two applicants here, Chack Investments LLC and Cutting Investments LLC. And the agent for this is Greg Ferris of Ferris Consulting. They're requesting an amendment to two conditional uses uh, to permit outdoor entertainment on property zoned LC Limited Commercial District on two pr properties that have a total of 2.47 uh, acres. The applicant is proposing one to amend conditional use 523 to modify the hours of operation for entertainment and to amend a uh, previous case con 2012-21 to allow outside music and dancing. The properties in question uh, that pertain to these parcels are currently developed with a cocktail lounge known as the Humidor and that's at 8558 West 21st Street Suite 100 and a restaurant known as Dudley's which is 8550 West 21st Street Suite 500. Uh, the humidor was previously cited for outdoor entertainment on the back patio, which abuts and looks out onto the golf course. Uh, the city received two noise complaints on August 5th and 6th of 2022. These noise complaints were received when outdoor entertainment occurred on the back patio of the humidor and included amplified speakers and, um, and instruments. Just a little bit of context, uh, the property to the north is developed with a golf course, but directly north of that is a uh, single family residential dwelling development. Uh, the shortest distance between the restaurant buildings and the actual dwelling is approximately 410 feet. So a little bit of case history on this property. In 1999, a conditional use was, was granted to allow outdoor entertainment and recreation. That was CU-523. However, the conditional use was only valid for six months from the date of the Wichita uh, City Council approval. Then in 2012, a conditional use was granted to allow a nightclub in the city for live music, dancing, and karaoke indoors. However, the conditional use prohibited outside loudspeakers and entertainment including dancing. So based on the uh, information that was given to us at the time, uh, we're recommending approval because the proposed application is in conformance with the 2035 future growth concept map of the community investments plan. The map identifies the area which the site is located to be appropriate for new employment. However, the proposed application is not in conformance with the locational guidelines of the community investments plan. The locational guidelines state that non-residential uses should have site design features that limit traffic, noise, lighting, and adverse impacts on surrounding residential land uses. The intensity of the use of the outdoor noise next to the residential use is thus not in conformance with the locational guidelines. So we're recommending approval of the conditional use amendment subject to the following conditions. This amendment shall only apply to the properties located at, uh, that are known for the Humidor and Dudleys. The applicant will adhere to the screening requirements of the Wichita Landscape Ordinance. 
No noise generated in, in conjunction with the outdoor use shall exceed a sound level of five decibels as a measure on the A scale with a sound pressure level mirror over the background noise. Any amplifiers or speakers shall not be pointed north. If lighting facilities are provided, the intensity and light arrangements of reflectors shall be such as to not interfere with residential uses. Outdoor and entertainment and dancing are allowed until 10 p.m. Sunday through Thursday and 12 a.m. on Friday and Saturday. A site plan showing the existing outdoor areas shall be submitted. If the zoning administrator finds that there is any violation of the conditions of the conditional use, we'll declare that the, con uh, the conditional use is null and void. The proposed conditional use amendment may negatively impact the adjacent single family de residential dwellings north of the subject property, north of the golf course. Uh, permitting entertainment may create some noise pollution. However, measures will be taken to mitigate these impacts. These measures include limiting the outdoor entertainment hours of operation. There is noise compatibility and nu nuisance regulations in the zoning code. There is a city noise ordinance and the condition that requires speakers being pointed away from residential zoning and the condition of additional screening around the patio. Uh, so there was a DAB meeting on Monday. There was discussion for about an hour amongst the DAB and they voted to deny the conditional use five to three. And I did receive some comments uh, regarding the humidor and Dudleys. You have these packets in front of you and I also sent out an email uh, a couple days ago uh, with those emails. And with that, I will stand for questions. Any questions? Uh, go ahead, Commissioner Green. Yes. Uh, what is the typical uh, requirement for um, properties that are zoned limited commercial and SF5? What, what needs to be on that uh, property line that joins those two zoning uh, areas? So there would be a fencing between the property and the residential uses. And I noticed that there is no fence anywhere There's currently no along, fencing. along any of that LC going next to the golf course. Correct. There are some sparse trees, but it doesn't qualify under the landscape ordinance. Any other questions? Uh, Commissioner Foster? So how would these conditions be um, um, enforced? enforced? Especially, especially item three. Item um, three. Does... Uh, uh, does, does a neighbor has to start uh, make a complaint about the noise. The noise then has to, um, someone from city staff has to go out and measure the decibel level in order to then have a, a valid complaint. Mm -hmm. Yes. In the first complaint, they, uh, they have 30 days to rectify the situation. And then after the second violation, it's declared to be null and void. But yes, yeah, someone would have to come out with a sound pressure meter, be it the zoning enforcement or the Wichita police or whoever has that machine. Just speaking from personal experience, I find it difficult to believe that anyone will be able to keep a band from aiming their amplifiers wherever they want to aim them. And then item four, um, how is the lighting so as not to interfere with residential uses, I'm not sure what that means and how how would that be enforced? I believe, um, I mean, one example could be that the lighting shall, shall not be pointed north or it shall not be pointed, or it should be within the fencing. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for staff at this point? Um, let's call forward the applicant or agent. Greg, if you give us your name and address, and you have 10 minutes. Madam Chairman, members of the Planning Commission, my name is Greg Ferris. Uh, I represent the owners of, these, of the properties. I reside at 144 South Bay Country Court here in Wichita. Um, I think there are uh, a few things that, that need to be considered here. First of all, um, clearly this case complies with the golden rules. And yeah, I'm just going to go through those while I provided those in a letter. I think it's important that uh, it be pointed out that because uh, staff made a couple of statements that I wouldn't necessarily agree with. Um, although I agree with their findings and I agree in general principle with their recommendations and we don't have any problem with the conditions as well. Um, but this is an area of uh, mixed and commercial uh, uses. It should be noted that if this golf course 
which a lot of golf courses are not zoned residential, if this wasn't zoned residential, we wouldn't have any issues because we wouldn't be within 300 feet of any residential property. So the only thing that we are really truly impacting is the golf course as far as what the, what the code uh, considers as residential. Uh, that golf course does provide quite a, quite a buffer uh, from the uh, proposed site. Um, the suitability uh, issue, the pandemic has changed everything the way businesses operate in our community. I think we're well aware that uh, where in Wichita we really rarely had much outdoor uh, dining, entertainment, those kind of things. This has now become much more prevalent. So because of that, um, w we need to think in a little different light on how we approve things. And so the suitability issue is really one because of the pandemic it needs to be taken in consideration. Um, I think that the extent to which this will be removed would be detrimental, I think, is where I probably disagree a little with staff. When you talk about, and going back, I'm not going to apologize for my client. He was an idiot. I mean, he should never have been playing music as loud as he played it. He wasn't allowed to play music, and he played it very loud. Um, Almost everything that I heard at the DAB and probably most of what you'll hear today is based on what happened in the past. That really isn't relevant. It isn't relevant to a zoning case that's moving forward because we have conditions that strictly limit the noise that can come off of that property. And while it's not all that common to have uh, somebody with a noise meter, my client actually has been monitoring his noise on a regular basis to make sure uh, that, that his indoor music even doesn't bleed out to be in excess of them. So he will have that and continue to monitor that. And he understands that in violation, if he's in violation, that he loses this. It only takes one complaint for someone to lose their conditional use. And so um, I think that, that there will be no detrimental impact to the area because the noise has been monitored, it's been restricted, so that whole issue now is really not uh, as important. Um, the gain to public health and safety, again, having the ability to have recreation outside uh, where people can freely congregate and not be worried about the effects of, uh, uh, of the pandemic, uh, I think is clearly in the interest and in the gain of public health. Uh, the comprehensive plan does cite this. She mentioned that it may violate the noise issue. But again, if this noise is restricted to 5 dBs over ambient noise, there will be no negative impact in noise to the surrounding area. Even the golf course will not be able to hear anything that's going on, much less properties four, five, six, seven, eight hundred feet away. So I think that's an important aspect to consider. So when you're looking at, at the aspects, finally, you have uh, the impact on um, the, um, the impact on community facilities, there will be no additional impact. It's, the streets are wide enough, and so we don't have to consider that. And finally, you have a recommendation of staff. The only issue on, in the entire Policy 10 that you can take into consideration that is a negative is there is neighborhood opposition, and, and we're sorry that we were not able to uh, accommodate that. But when you think of five decibels over ambient noise, uh, this is a huge uh, step to make sure there are no negative issues. Uh, the issues in the past are in the past. He cannot do that again. If he does, he loses his conditional use, and so I don't think those are the, uh, much of an issue. Uh, with that, I'd be glad to answer any questions. Uh, questions from the commissioners? Commissioner Green? <clears throat> yeah, Mr. Ferris. Um, when did you start monitoring the sound um, at, at the venue, and how many events have you had since you started monitoring the sound? Well, they have events every weekend, but they are indoors. They are not allowed to be outdoors. So uh, they, they have the doors open often, um, and so they monitor it. Uh, they've been monitoring it ever since uh, they were sighted. So uh, back into August uh, when they were when they were cited, so they've been monitoring it on a regular basis, and I don't believe that there's uh, at least from the testimony at the DAB, there has been no complaints uh, from the noise um, since that time, and that's because five decibels is really not very loud. 
Thank you. Any other commissioner questions at this time? Yes, yes I, I have Commission a question. Okay, uh, Hi. Commissioner Cunningham, go ahead. Yes, um, Mr. Ferris, uh, Chris, Christine, I think, said that uh, it takes two times to violate the the noise ordinance, and you're saying that since he already has one violation, it will only take one more. Is am no. I understanding that right? I'm sorry if I if I misunderstood me. No, this is this is a conditional use that allows the outdoor entertainment. So if there's a a violation of that. Uh, conditional use conditions. Uh, he was in violation. He was notified. He immediately ceased any operation. So he's now in compliance uh, with that notice. Um, if there is a, if the conditional use is approved um, and there is a violation, he will receive a written notice from the um, planning department uh, zoning administrator that says he's in violation. He will have 30 days to be in compliance. If he violates uh, that again at any time, he loses his conditional use. So everything that happened prior to the filing of this case really is irrelevant other than it really stirred up a lot of uh, negative thoughts. And well, it should have because he should never have done what he did. Um, he may have misunderstood what he was allowed to do, even if he was allowed. I mean, uh, the noise was well in excess of anything that was reasonable. I'm not going to apologize for him. It was a mistake. Shouldn't have happened. Um, but going forward, that becomes irrelevant as we're looking at the new conditions of what's allowed. Commissioner McKay. Greg, uh, did you say in your presentation that you agree with the staff's recommendations? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Right. Any other questions? Hearing none, we'll now take public comment. So if you're here to speak on this case, please approach the podium. You'll have three minutes. And uh, because of the length of our agenda and the number of persons, we're going to be very strict on the three minutes. You'll have a prompting card here to note 30 seconds remaining and 15 seconds remaining to help you uh, wrap up your thoughts. Thank you. And please state your name and address. And you may begin. And please speak into the microphone. Thank you. I don't need the mic, trust me. <laughs> My name is Kevin, last name Shaw, and 2402 North Ridgeside Circle in Reflection. Back off. No, over here. Thank you. Oh, okay. Uh, okay, go ahead. Speak into the mic. Yes. I'm going to show you some pictures. Pass them around to you. Sir? Yeah. We'll take your okay. Yeah. We, the reason for the microphone so everyone knows is so that persons participating virtually can also hear you. It's impossible for them to hear anything spoken not into your microphone. Okay. Um, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So I'm going to pass. Got some pictures going around there. And uh, those pictures will give you a different perspective of the residence that's in behind right there. And I'm telling you now. There may be some changes based on what Greg has had to say, but an outdoor, an outdoor rock and roll group, I know as a musician, I've played a hundred of these gigs. I'm an audiologist as well. I've worked in the lab. I understand frequencies. And I'm telling you now, you will never have a four to five piece rock and roll group that is staying under that. I'm usually, we were running 100 to 120 decibels. I usually had earplugs in my ears. And you get outside where you just have unfettered access with that sound channeling down as you look at those pictures. And I've got some measurements. Almost a half a mile away, we are picking up 70 decibels. A half a mile away on some of those nights that we had. And you'll see that on that on one of the maps that I have. I talked, I was over at the, the 5th District meeting on Monday night, and the 5th District uh, decided uh, not to approve this because it just really is nonsense in the backside. The music is still inside the building, and that's great. I can still hear it. I'm about a tenth of a mile out, but it's acceptable, and I don't begrudge you know, the business trying to thrive that way, and we want them to, but keeping the music inside rather than out. I'm going to run a little test here with you. I've got a baseline because this was the biggest issue 
with this normal DBs versus five DBs over. The, uh, the fifth district, they just couldn't get their heads wrapped around it. So I measured, and you'll see this right here. I measured that at the back of the, of the humidor, at the back of the property line. It was 59 DBs. Now, what I'm going to do, I measured in here as well. You're running about uh, 59 to 61 dBs right now, normal. I want you to just, when I tell you to do so, just to clap for me. Everybody clap. I just want you to clap for me. Ready? Go. Uh, but, but can you give me a event, report and that concludes your comments? That was 85. Okay. That's just clapping. Imagine a four to five piece group. Hey, thank you. It's not possible. Thank you. Next speaker, please give your name and address. You'll have three minutes. And I'd remind you that any items or issues that have been raised, we ask you not to repeat, but add new concerns or issues that haven't been already uh, presented. Good afternoon. My name is Paul Moffitt, M-O-F-F-I-T-T. -T. I live at 2306 North Pepper Ridge Circle. And if you look at uh, page 8 of your diagram, you'll see Pepper Ridge is the first set of houses that backs up to the humidor. Uh, Pepper Ridge Circle has 10 children under the age of 10 living on that street. They want music to go to 10 o'clock on school nights and midnight on Saturdays and Sundays. I have said in my house, and I'm understanding the words of the songs, I have called the humidor. I did not call 911. I've called the humidor numerous times to complain about the noise. I was told they are within compliance of their permit. That's what the people told me. Now, I'm not sure I can trust them with this additional responsibility. They have shown a propensity not to follow the rules. And who is going to be responsible to make sure that they follow the rules? Because you can violate on Friday and not get over there until Saturday to test and they're fine. Then you have nothing that you can complain about. So those are my issues. We've got kids. I've lived there 18 years. And it has been a quiet, lovely neighborhood to live in. And that's where I want to finish my term on this earth is in that house. So uh, thank you for listening to me. I appreciate it. Thanks for your comments, Mr. Moffitt. Next speaker, please. Commissioner Any Chair. questions of the speaker before yes, he gets the, away or the previous asking. speaker? Commissioners, I failed to ask. You have a question, Mr. Blick? Yeah, that's. I was going to ask a question from the previous speaker, um, but we went on. We went yeah, past I'm, I apologize. I a question. Mr. Audiologist, can we ask you a question, please? I apologize for not having your name. We have a question for you from one of the commissioners. Go ahead, Commissioner Blick. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, a question I have is from the statement that you said a second ago, you didn't have a problem with them internally, but you just had a problem with them on the outside. Is correct. That correct? It, it makes a total difference. I can still, a tenth of a mile away, I can still hear the music inside, but I can live with that. I want the business to do well. It's, it's, I want the patrons to enjoy that. So not after that at all, but you bring those bands outside and bring those decibels up. It is impossible to stay over your city guidelines of five decibels over the norm. It's okay. impossible. Thank you. Okay, You're thank welcome. you. All right, now, next speaker, please. Thank you. Hi, my name is Kay Bruce. I live at 2418 North Morning Dew Street. I wish you'd lower the map um, because I live further up. I live quite a ways away. I look over the 1st, the 18th, the 17th, the 16th, and I sit out on my patio every night, and I enjoy the stars and the quiet. 
and it is a big shock when the music comes flying through the house. It comes through a brick house, and I hear it on the back side of several walls, several homes, several trees, berms, and I still hear the music. So it, it is in, it's impeding my enjoyment of my life. And while our job is to make sure that we can all live together, um, a person who can't make decisions well is a person who continues to not make decisions well. Um, I'm a little surprised that in the fact finding it didn't come out that there is a major uh, older folks home directly north and west. And I guarantee that those old folks aren't enjoying the home, the, the sound, especially if they have Alzheimer's or dementia. That's got to be causing a problem. Other, the second thing that is, hasn't been brought up is the drainage around this. They put a patio out and they've never made the drainage correct. So let's make sure that he has to do the things he has been given permission for correctly. Because so far, he doesn't follow through. A uh, question for, please remain. We have a question for you. Yeah, on, on your, uh, your comments about the noise uh, that, that you're hearing, was that the two events that they were cited for, or is this every weekend that you're hearing? This, Not every this, this weekend, one? but I have heard them more than just that weekend. I was outside the, the 5th and 6th, but I have heard them other weekends as well. And at, at what time of the evening was that? I would say it's anywhere from 9 to a, about 11 o'clock at night. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for the speaker? Thank you. Next speaker, please. I'm Dean Basil. I'm at 2511 North Lake Ridge Circle. I've lived there since 2001 and have enjoyed it until about a year ago. I live 0.4 miles north of the humidor. And I have a map. I drew out that 0.4 mile radius. There are 97 homes in Reflection Ridge that fall within that 0.4 mile radius, which is quite a few. When this really happened, I sent a letter to the city manager because it was really perturbing to me. I sent it on the 25th of June or July. Uh, the weekend of July 22nd and 23rd was extremely loud. I have a voice memo from my iPhone if anybody would care to hear it from where I was sitting on my patio, it's stamped where I was. I know what was going on, and it was like at 1045, 1052 at night. Inside my house, I could hear drum rim shots. I could hear bass, and that's inside my house. That shouldn't happen. That's a quarter mile away, or almost a half a mile away. Can I ask Mr. Ferris a question? You can state your question, and he'll have two minutes to read the question. Well, right let now. me just finish up the few things. Some people have covered a lot of this. Um, I think it's ridiculous to have it open on a week on weeknights until 10 o'clock. There's a lot of kids that have to go to bed. It's hard enough to get them to go to sleep. These kids have to get up early. The street exactly north of the humidor, the bus picks those kids up at 7.45 in the morning. I saw them Friday. I know when it is. They shouldn't have to do that. I don't think that approving this amendment is going to rectify the noise problem and only increases the possibility it'll continue. Inside music, I don't have a problem with. If they want to do that and open their doors and can keep it under control, great. Outside music, I agree with Kevin. I don't think there's a way in the world that they can handle that the way they're supposed to. So 
I'd ask you to put yourselves in the shoes of the families that are living there that are affected, and they have to deal with this. The only way to eliminate it totally as an issue is to not pass the amendment. My question to you, Greg, is when you made a comment about when they were doing inside measurements that they weren't going above the five decibels above background sound, is that right? And so have they had any outside entertainment since then that you have measured? And Hilt will have him answer that in his rebuttal. Thank you for your comments. And again, thank you for not repeating issues that have been raised by a previous speaker. Next speaker. OK, thank you. Thank you for not repeating. We appreciate that. Next speaker, please. My name's Larry Combs. I live at 2406 North Ridgeside Circle. I did not come with uh, prepared comments for you, but as I listen, I, I feel compelled to say just a couple of things. And first, that would be to thank you for your time. I'm a retired public servant. I know you have a thankless job, and I thank you for your time serving the public. And I know you have tough decisions. The only thing I would like to add to the conversation, it's well documented, the, the sound and the disruptiveness of it is uh, I don't know the impact. I see the Dudley facility is also embedded in this. I don't know what that will do, but we add another facility. We compound the problem. I don't know a lot about planning laws, but I do know as a retired school superintendent, I dealt with decisions we made and the precedents we set after the fact. Uh, Greg alluded to the fact that the pandemic has changed things, and yes, it has. I don't think you've heard the last of uh, complaints about outside venues. Uh, I would ask you to proceed with caution in your decision. Uh, I grew up on the back of a show horse, spent a lot of hours around the barn, and my dad would always say, don't leave the barn door open. In this case, it's open a crack, and I can assure you that if we don't close it uh, and walk away from it, the horses will get out. So please use judiciousness in your decision and think about the future because it is a planning commission and the decisions you make for today are also for tomorrow. Thank you for your time and appreciate all you do for us. Thank you for your testimony. Questions for the speaker? Okay, thank you. Next speaker, please. My name is Marilyn Eels, and my daughter and two grandsons and I live at 2401 North Ridgeside Circle. We have for almost 13 years and can see the humidor outdoor patio from my house. We have already experienced disruptive nights. As others have mentioned, my house rattled from the base. No one could go to sleep until they quit playing way after midnight. Some children and even teenagers are very affected by this also. We have teenagers at our house. Having to deal with the music even until 10 p.m. during the week is detrimental to all ages getting the required amount of sleep. This is not just a summer thing. The outdoor patio area at the humidor is used in the spring and fall too. Even my teenage grandsons go to bed early since they have to get up at 5.45 a.m. to get ready for school, and the bus to take them is at our, our corner at 6.40 a.m. Reflection Ridge homeowners should not have to deal with zoning amendments now that will be detrimental to our community environment and disturb our sleep and health. I also would like to mention um, that before this past incident, this summer, two years even, when the doors are all opened in the, the like garage doors at the humidor, we can hear the music at our house. I have never called and complained because I hate doing that and we have put up with it. But I have neighbors that have and they weren't receptive to even turn it down then. It was like 
bad attitude. Um, I just, even last night, it was just talking. There was a lot of people out on the patio, and we could hear the voices in our backyard. So imagine what it would be if there was bands playing out there. I also would just like to say that I'm concerned about the incidents of even the crime in the area and drunk driving. I've already had a drunk driver leave Dudley's and miss the curb and come through the fence in my backyard. Luckily, it stopped before it hit my house. And my neighbor behind me has also had a couple incidences. We chose to live in Reflection Ridge because of it being a great family environment and peaceful neighborhood. Put yourselves in our place for just a moment. Would you like to have loud music that you can't control in your house each evening, affecting your home life and family? I just ask that the commission's responsibility is also to to protect the community interest and not just the business requesting the amendments. I ask you to please reject these requests for the outdoor entertainment. Thank, thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Any questions for the speaker? Yes, I have one. Go ahead, Ms. Cunningham. We have a question for you if um, you remain at this podium. I'll wait till she gets back. Go ahead. Okay. Um, we've heard a lot about the pandemic and how it's affected business um, and the need for outdoor uh, music. Can you tell me about you and your neighbors? Are you spending more time outdoors um, than you did before the pandemic started? I've always been an outdoor person and been in my yard and that. So, no, I do, wouldn't say now that that has affected me being out in my yard anymore. I love doing, uh, having the flowers and the yard work. And I will just say the night that the drunk driver came through the fence, you can't believe how many people walk down our sidewalk along the side of our house is along reflection road which is the main road there's always people walking i believe you've answered her question Have, has she answered your question miss cunningham yeah, yes okay. thank you thank you thank you i hate to cut you off but again if you have a new uh, information to add beyond noise hours children needing sleep uh peacefulness in the neighborhood please step forward to the podium and provide your new information my name is Nick Morton. I live at 2309 North High Point Circle. And the first thing I wanted to note is I read through the staff report, I noticed the recommendation was approval with conditions. And if I'm not mistaken, I believe Christina said at the DAB meeting that given the information we had at the time, that was the recommendation. I don't believe they realized the pushback they would get and the level of concern in the community there was no outreach, there was no query of the neighborhood, no canvassing. And from what I understand, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, the state law for a business's size has a notification radius of 350 feet. So nobody was notified about this pending amendment. And so they didn't have any input that would have maybe changed this recommendation. Another thing that wasn't notified was noise, physics, and science. Because if you could talk to noise and tell it you can only go out 350 feet and then we'd like you to stop, then we wouldn't be here today. But common sense tells us that's not the case. The noise will continue to travel no matter how many barriers you put up, how much landscaping, which way you point the speakers. Noise will find a way to get through and it will disrupt the neighborhood. <clears throat> it doesn't matter. The golf course does not act as a barrier. It acts as a megaphone. It amplifies. <clears throat> it travels right down the fairway, which is why you can hear it so far away. It doesn't matter if you have a sick two-year-old that you're desperately trying to get to sleep that night. Noise will continue. It doesn't matter if you have an Alzheimer's husband who wonders where that sound's coming from. It'll still continue. It doesn't matter if you have to catch a flight early the next morning or what shift you work, the noise will continue. After attending the DAB meeting, I went home and tried to understand myself the uh, amendment that was proposed and the process itself, and I came up with this analogy. Someone going to buy a new pair of shoes. The existing shoes were working just fine. 
I thought, you know, I can walk farther. My health will be better if I get a new pair of shoes. Went and got a new pair of shoes and came home. They were the size, the color, the size that I wanted. Couldn't get them on. I said, I don't understand. I checked the size again. They were the right size, but they still couldn't get them on. I said, I know what I'll do. I'll contact the guy that used to work at the shoe store. He'll help me get into them. So he came over and he checked, says, well, here, I'll uh, undo the shoelaces. There's some tissue in there. I've got a shoehorn. We'll ram your foot down in there. See, I got you in them. But he walked around. He says, you know, they're still uncomfortable. I, they still don't feel right. Well, I'll tell you what we'll do. Wear these shoes only until 10 p.m. on Sunday through Thursday, and then wear these shoes till midnight if you want on Friday and Saturday. He said, you know what? I tried that. They still hurt. They're actually causing me pain. So I, I'm afraid in this case, they just don't fit. Thank I would you submit to you, ladies and gentlemen, that this proposed yeah. amendment to these conditions of use for this business at this location does not fit. And I would plead with you to vote to deny this request. Thank you for your testimony. Your, any questions for this speaker? You have a question, Mr. Duell? Just a correction. I believe the distance is 200 yes. feet. Mike, will you use your microphone, please? Yeah. Thank you. The uh, distance uh, in this case, a uh, notification distance is 300 feet. 200, 200 feet, feet, excuse me. Thank you. Well, uh, just a just comment on that. Um, based on the acreage, it's actually 2.47 acres. So okay. city policy is that it would qualify for for the 350 foot notification. But you're right, Mr. Duell. State law, the requirement per state law is 200 feet in the city. But the, in this case, the city boosts it up if it meets certain acreage threshold thresholds. Okay, thanks for the clarification. Is there any speaker with additional concerns that haven't been presented that would like to speak? If none, then we'll call back. Uh, Mr. Oh, virtually, is there anyone participating virtually who has additional concerns to express to the commission? All right, hearing none, uh, Mr. Ferris, you have two minutes for rebuttal and response to the questions posed. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, the one question was, uh, has there been any outdoor entertainment? I think that was the only question asked directly of me. No, there has not uh, been any outdoor entertainment uh, during the uh, time since they were cited. <clears throat> uh, a couple things that I think are very important is virtually everything you heard today uh, in opposition was related to loud music. Um, we're not allowed to have loud music. One speaker said it is impossible not to have loud music. I contend that whether it's impossible or not, if they have loud music, they will be closed down from their conditional use and no longer uh, be able to have that. So it doesn't matter whether it's impossible or not. Um, the truth is that it must be possible. Uh, the the uh, recommendations are that there is a certain level that is allowed and that that level uh, not be exceeded. And so um, based on the information that you have based on the policy 10 the only thing that has been cited here besides neighborhood opposition there's nothing besides neighborhood opposition the dab vote is a reflection of neighborhood opposition and uh, the Supreme Court has ruled that uh, neighborhood opposition is not enough of a reason to deny a uh, case and based on your own policies and guidelines uh, we must uh, look at what the entirety of Policy 10 is, and Policy 10 does, along with staff's recommendation, reflect that this should be approved. Um, noise does travel. Can't stop noise from traveling. But if you restrict the amount of noise, then it doesn't travel very far. Uh, those are the issues that are before you, is a condition that restricts this to five decibels over uh, ambient noise. So I think that that is uh, the most Im imperative thing. He showed, he clapped your hands and that was 85 dBs. We can't even be that loud. As loud as the applause, you can't even be that loud with music. Um, so, uh, and pretty obvious if there's going to be complaints, there will be complaints. Um, if it's not going to, if it doesn't comply. So uh, we believe that uh, we've shown all the elements that exist 
and would recommend that you vote for approval. Be glad to answer any other questions. Any other questions for <coughs> Mr. Ferris from the commission? <coughs> if none, then I would ask the commission to speak your pleasure. I've got a, I've got a question for staff. Um, on the approval, the condition number two, uh, the applicant will adhere to the screening requirements of the Wichita Landscape Ordinance. Is that, does that include the wall and landscaping, or is that just that, Yes, that includes the wall and landscaping. Wall and landscaping. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Any other questions? And Discussion. Hugh, Mr. So, Commissioner Nix. So eight-foot wall is what we're talking about. Uh, Mr. Yes. Wadle. Madam Chair, if I may, um, the one clarification that we've got on there is that it says landscape ordinance, but in truth, it should be the landscape buffer, which is required in the zoning code. So that may be one thing that is causing the, the questions too. And the buffer requirement is the eight foot wall plus? Six foot. No. It says the landscape ordinance does not require a fence or a wall it does require landscape buffer, so additional landscaping, but not solid screening. Solid screening is per the zoning code. This condition requires additional landscaping per the landscape ordinance. Then I, I guess, I guess my question is: then it's a limited commercial set next to uh, SF5 residential. Is there not a requirement uh, for a uh, screening wall to be between limited commercial and uh, SF5? It depends on when the property was zoned commercially. There was a time that the zoning code did not require screening between commercial and residential zoning. Uh, I don't know when off the top of my head of when this particular property was zoned commercially, but if it was zoned commercially prior to that requirement, uh, then it does not have to comply with that screening standard. Do do we know do we know when that requirement was set forth? Not when this was zoned limited commercial. Do you have any idea when that was? Is that something that can be uh, researched and then determined whether or not they need to put a wall up along with the landscaping? Yes, that is something staff can research. And. Through this process, if you would like to add a condition to require a screening fence or a screening wall, you might want to differentiate between the two. Um, you could add it as a condition if you feel the current conditions are not adequate. Yes, Commissioner Foster. Mr. Hartman may want to weigh in on this as well, but working in landscape architecture, it seems to me I've read research that whereas landscape screening trees and shrubs can help buffer visually, they in fact do not particularly buffer sound. Is that correct? He's not He's here, not but here. I can tell I'm you that's I'm pretty correct. sure that's correct. Especially the, the lower frequencies, which is what you hear. You hear the bass beat. It travels incredibly far. Uh, any other discussion? Are we ready to Throw out a motion. Yeah, I'd like to make a motion to uh, approve the um, request here. Uh, and I would like to add, uh, in addition to the uh, screening and the landscape buffer, I would also like to include a six to eight foot wall uh, along that property line. We have a motion. Is there a second for this motion? I have a motion second by Mr. Warren. I'd like to make a substitute motion to deny the application. I have a substitute second. motion to deny a second from Ms. Cunningham. Is that correct? Miles. A second was by Ms. Miles to deny the motion. We'll take a roll call vote on the substitute motion. Yes, ma'am. On the motion to deny, Fox. Yes. Duel. No. McKay. Yes. Green. No. 
Bill Johnson. No. Blick. No. Sorry, Mr. Blick, we didn't get get that. No. Can you hear me? I believe Mr. Blick's vote was no. No. Is that accurate? Nod your head. Yes, correct. Okay. No. Nix. <laughs> yes. Foster. Yes. Yes. Warren. No. Joe Johnson. Yes. Miles. Yes. Hartman is absent. Cunningham. Yes. Williams Bay. Yes. Madam Chair, I have the vote as eight yes, five no. Motion passes. Thank you for your testimony. Next case, item 4.3, conditional use 2022 0034. Um, and presenting is Philip. Yes, thank you. I just might take a moment and just let the room clear. If, you are, if those of you who are here for the previous case would like to exit, you no longer need to be required for the meeting. If we just take two seconds, I'm lucky here. Thank you guys for coming today. We appreciate your comments. Okay, we'll call for silence again and continue to proceed. Thank. Go ahead with the staff report, Philip. Yes, thank you, Philip Zevenberger hey, uh, with planning excuse staff. Excuse me, I need to. I need to say that I was at the DAB, and when they called for the vote, I left the room. I left the room about halfway through, so I did have exposure to this case, but I left, uh, and I feel like I can be uh, fair, so I'm not going to recuse myself. Okay, thank you. And you're talking about the case we're uh, coming up on right now, correct? Yeah, if okay. it's the sign case. Yeah. All right, thank you very much. Okay, again, Philip Zevenbergen for the record. Conditional use 2022-34's request to allow a off-site billboard sign within 300 feet of residential zoning and residential uses. As you can see on the screen, the property is located on the west side of North Hydraulic between Hydraulic and I-135, about a quarter mile north of East 37th Street. You go to the aerial image, Paul, um, the property is very long and lean, and the front of the property on the hydraulic side is an auto sales and auto repair business, and rightly so, the uh, requested billboard sign would be um, developed on the western portion of the property along the I-135 corridor to advertise goods, services, and messages along um, the highway for motorists passing both north and south it would be a two-sided sign um, just to be clear there is not a off-site billboard sign currently constructed on this property this is a request for a new sign on this property this sign is being heard in conjunction with a variance request which is bza 2241 which will be heard during the board of zoning appeals portion of this meeting this one had to be considered first because they're requesting an increase in height of the sign but you can't request an increase of a height on a sign that doesn't have a recommendation for approval or exist yet so we need to make a recommendation on the conditional use first before we can consider whether or not to increase the height of that sign if the conditional use does move forward the request for the increase in height would increase the height from 30 feet to 60 feet to get above an existing mature tree line the sign code restricts off-site billboard signs even though the property is zoned general industrial it restricts the off-site billboard sign because it is within 300 feet from the sign to not just residential zoning on the north but residential uses on the south um, there's an exhibit in the your staff report and online if you want to go to the site plan poem that shows the line distances kind of kind of hard to read with thin lines but the nearest residence i believe is about 100 or 185 feet um, from the sign location and several of the homes um, within the area even if they are zone general industrial are less than 300 feet from where the sign location is therefore they need the conditional use request in order to permit the sign 
The property to the north is the one that zoned single family with a residential home. All of these properties to the south along East 39th Street, they're zoned general industrial, and but they are developed with single family homes. If the sign is permitted, it would adhere to all the other standards of the Wichita sign code, save the height requirement, which again would be considered by the Board of Zoning Appeals to be increased in height. Um, but we'll discuss that um, during that case if we need to. Surrounding context is majority zoned general industrial with commercial industrial and residential uses. The nearest offsite sign is on the east side, about 850 feet south of this location in 2021. That sign was approved by the Board of Zoning Appeals to increase its height to 60 feet to get above a existing mature tree line. Just a little bit of background on these variance cases. Again, we'll dive more into the variance as well, but they're, they're arising due to the um, KDOT acquiring right of way from these properties, shifting their boundaries to the east to where the locations of the signs are now behind these trees, whereas where the property lines used to be, the trees would not have been a problem um, and they would have been able to have a more standard size sign. But because KDOT acquired right of way for the North Junction expansion, their right of way, their property lines moved east, putting the location of tree or location of the signs behind the trees. The community investment, investments plan identifies the property as appropriate for residential uses. However, the predominant zoning in the area is general industrial. So even the residential uses to the south, if they're acquired by other folks, would not have to say residential. They could be redeveloped with industrial uses. Again, they are currently used as residential uses, these properties right here. The land use compatibility location guidelines of the comprehensive plan say that industrial and major commercial uses that generate pollution, odor, noise, light pollution, safety hazards, and other levels of traffic should be located away from residential uses or developed with screening, buffering, and site design features that mitigate the adverse impacts of those uses. The applicant intends to keep the mature trees along the property lines and that can buffer the sites to the south from the offsite billboard signs nearby. Um, these residences are located near a major interstate highway that already generates noise, odor, light pollution. The addition of the eyesight sign will bring these visual impacts closer to these homes. Um, and could impact these properties potentially a little bit more than the nearby um, interstate highway. The intention is to have the trees help mitigate some of that, um, but you will be bringing some of those um, factors closer to these homes and what is already existing based on the interstate. Overall staff is recommending approval subject to conditions. Those conditions are that the height shall not exceed 60 feet as shown on an approved site plan. Um, the offsite sign shall adhere to all applicable setbacks. There should be only one offsite sign allowed on the zoning lot. Um, the applicant has to obtain all necessary permits to construct the sign, and the sign shall conform to the requirements of the sign code. I've received uh, one comment. It's at your desk. It did go to DAB. Um, the DAB recommended denial of this application. Um, there was discussion that they feel the, um, if the sign is approved and is located there, it would have adverse impacts to the residential uses that are nearby. As a clarification, if since the DAB recommended denial um, and they already went through the city council side of the um, public hearing, um, if this board recommends denial, then there's no need to hear the variance request because it would not have to go to city council for final approval with two recommendations of denial from this board and the district advisory board, the conditional use would not be approved and the variance request would not need to be heard. Um, just as a clarification. With that, we can uh, go through the pictures. Paul, if you wanna to jump to those, we can go through pictures of the site. This is the sign exhibit that they provided saying if this was the standard size of the sign, that's um, how it would be blocked by the trees. This is looking north along I-135 and you can see this is their exhibit of where they want it to be. Again, that's based on the variance. What this conditional use is looking at is whether or not a sign is appropriate at this location, not whether or not it should be at this height. Next slide, please. 
This is looking at the front of the property. This is the auto sales and auto repair along hydraulic. Next picture, please. This is looking at a house north of the property. Next picture. This is looking from I-135 at the site. This is where they would be constructing the sign. Something to note is this is one of the trees that would be blocking the standard size of the um, sign. And you can see it is planted on the property line. This fence actually butts into the tree and stops and then it continues on the other side of the trunk. Um, so in terms of whether or not somebody had the authority to trim the tree down to allow a, a standard size sign to be seen, ownership of the tree is in question. Uh, so, in, and it's kind of intended that they want to use the tree as the buffering mechanism for the sign anyway. Next picture, please. This is along I-135. This is the sign that was approved south of the location. This one, again, is approved to the 60-foot height, um, and again, about 850 feet south of the location. Next picture. This is the house directly south of the property. This would, the sign would basically be up at this location over top of these trees. Um, on your aerial photograph, there, there used to be a house here, but when KDOT acquired right-of-way, that lot no longer exists. So this house is the second house in on your aerial uh, um, map in your staff report. Next picture. This is looking from that house south to the billboard that already exists that got the increase in height. Next picture. This is looking uh, northeast along East 39th Street. I'm right at the highway and I'm looking back towards the road at other residential properties that are again in the general industrial zoning. Next picture. And again, here's your aerial. Again, this house right here no longer exists. So the, the picture of the house looking north that I showed you is this property right here. And the sign would be located somewhere in here because this property line is now farther east due to highway ac acquisition. I can stand for any questions. Any, qu any questions for Philip from the commission? Yep. Go ahead, yes, Ms. So, Cunningham. Um, <clears throat> where those uh, two dashes are, those are, I drove up there, those are um, uh, trailers, right? I believe so. That that's right. That's about where the sign is going to go. Approximately. Is that right? Approximately, yes. Cause I can't, yeah, because I can't see your arrows um, okay. when you when I'm at home. So how far is that sign going to be from that the remaining westernmost house on 39th? Reading my site plan here, It looks like it's about going to be about 152 feet to the okay. southern structure on the property, which is the home. There is a, a an additional structure behind that home, but it's not a residence. Yeah. And then that big tree that's right by that additional structure, that's where the tree line begins now. And the ones to the east of there, they're gone. And so is that building and those three cars. That's where... And that house, that's where the... I think you mean to goes, the west. Right? Yeah, the, the trees to the west and the home structure to the west on the aerial, they no longer exist because of the highway acquisition. Okay, okay, thank you. Any other questions for Philip from the commission? Uh, then we will call the applicant aid or agent, and you have 10 minutes. I'm chairman, members of the Planning Commission. I'm still Greg Ferris, and I still reside at 144 South Bay. Today is your day. Now, you have no idea. Fortunately, <laughs> one of them was already passed by consent, so thank you for that. A um, couple things I'd like to point out, first and foremost. This is really not a conditional use. It says con because they don't have any mechanism in their system for noting that this is a special exception to the sign code. So it doesn't fall under the same rules as a conditional use. And perhaps you know, Mr. Zandank can, Zandan can qualify that. But this is, uh, and if Mr. Um, Cox was here, he could also verify that we're not seeking a conditional use today. Uh, the reason that that's important is that this doesn't fall under the purview of Policy 10. So we didn't list a set of findings 
uh, for policy 10 because the code clearly specifies that there are three findings that need to take place uh, for approval of a special exception. Um, the first one is the zoning and character of the neighborhood. Uh, this is an industrial area. There are residential houses. They won't be there you know, forever. This is an industrially zoned area off of an interstate. So the character of this area is highly industrial. I think that's important to note is that while there are some houses, uh, those houses are in industrial and are all basically non-conforming because uh, if they wanted to improve those structures, if they were going to improve it by a certain amount, they wouldn't be allowed to because houses, <coughs> excuse me, residential dwellings are not allowed in light commercial, in light industrial. So all of those houses are non-conforming. The second point is the suitability of the subject property for the proposed off-site sign. We're used to talking about the suitability in a different light, but because, again, this is a special exception, this is not a conditional use, um, this, this is zoned industrial. The sign code encourages signs in industrial. It's along a highway and the sign code encourages signs along a highway. Therefore, we clearly meet the, uh, th that provision. And lastly is the conformance of the uh, comprehensive plan. Uh, I think staff has outlined that it is in compliance. Uh, one of the things that uh, the comp comprehensive plan talks about is light emissions. Uh, Mr. Jeff Gordon, who uh, will be the owner of the sign, is here. Uh, I'm going to uh, give him a few of my uh, minutes to go over why this sign will have absolutely no impact uh, and that uh, raising it up when we get to the BZA actually mitigates uh, some of those issues and he can talk about some of the experiences he's had. Um, I will not ask for questions now. I'll let Mr. Uh, Gordon speak, and then uh, when there are questions at the end. So I think that, that the couple things that are very important, and I think I also disagree a little with Philip, not that necessarily we would move forward, but again, because this is not a conditional use, it's a special exception. Special exceptions are always ruled on by the city council. Um, the code is very clear on how special exemptions special exceptions um, to the sign code work, and that's what this is. So if this was not uh, near, and it's 200 feet to the uh, south property, south house, not, uh, I think Philip was having trouble seeing small print, so did I. <clears throat> but the, um, uh, so it, it isn't 150, it's more like 200 and plus uh, feet to that house and that uh, we are closer to that, to the property line uh, to the north. So Mr. Uh, Mr. Gordon, if you want to come forward. So I think it's important to remember that this is different than what you're used to. And the reason is there's probably only been two or three of these in all the time that you guys have been up here and most people aren't used to them. So this is Jeff Gordon and you'll need to give your name and address. Uh, hello, my name is Jeff Gordon. I own uh, Gordon Outdoor Advertising. I am the applicant. Um, I think everybody probably knows this, but just to, just to clarify. Uh, you have to come back to the mic, Jeff, and point to it. And actually, oh, I'm sorry. Okay. There's a mouse here. So, okay, I apologize. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, this area, I think everybody is pretty clear on this, but just to uh, confirm, this house right here, I mean, this basically now, this line going right here. And everything to the what is that west is not there. So this this aerial photo, uh, photograph, um, you know, o K dot took that area. So the frontage is right here. This is the proposed location, correct, where the sign is. Um, and I'd like to just say um, I started this company 23 years ago. Every, I have a lot of these signs. Every sign that I have. I, I developed and built, so I had to go through similar situations like this. And I am uh, totally respect that any, any, any people around that sign might have concern. I get it. Um, but a couple of things I'd like to point out. This, um, and I say this respectfully, and I learned this by default just being in the business. The lower a sign is, the more offensive it is, ultimately, uh, because... You're, I mean, you've got businesses, you've got houses looking to and from things. 
if you've got a 30 foot OVH overall height of a sign, that puts the haggle, meaning the bottom of the sign face, at 15 foot, 12 foot, depending on the um, height of the sign face. I say that it's kind of opposite of what most people would assume. Actually, the higher a sign is and the closer it is to a certain structure, the better it is for whoever's in the structure. I have multiple signs that are that are similar. Um, and, and I can honestly say, I, out, of, out of all of them, I do not have one surrounding neighbor, whether it be residential within a certain distance or commercial, not one of them that is an enemy or has a problem with what, what I've done. Um, we build the best signs you can build, the highest quality, no matter what components we put on it. They're all black. Um, they, they look good. This sign, and, and I can understand, I mean, if someone's, if someone's coming in with a sign, I mean, it, it's, it's just nature to be a little bit um, concerned about, you know, what's this going to do? It's going to be close to us. Or are we going to be overpowered by a sign? I, I can just tell you from experience that this, this scenario right here, it just, I think at the end of the day, would, not, would, would just be non-material as far as being offensive. Um, it would be... I have, coincidentally, I have a few that are literally close to residences like this, and I mean, they don't even they don't even notice the sign at the end of the day. I mean, it's above them. If I was forced to put the sign lower, that's when it becomes potentially problematic because you look out your windows and you see it. So, um, the sign will be a V shape, not unlike other billboards you see on the highway. Uh, Wichita allows a twenty five foot separation in the back end of the sign. Um, this would be oriented to where the right-hand read going south. Is that north? Yeah, north, I'm sorry. The right-hand read going north, um, it's going to be flared out toward the highway. And for the people that don't know, it's easy to assume um, light from a billboard, unlike a flashlight, it doesn't project light and shine on something. It just is light. So, you know, it, it's... It's easy to assume, oh, this thing's going to, you know, blow us away. Again, that would be up above, and it would be pointed at the highway, so it would be irrelevant. I, and I feel like, you know, on this lot, the landowner, you know, he, I mean, what is this, commercial, industrial? Just, just, you know, we just feel like this is an area where it's not in the middle of a neighborhood, in the middle of town. So uh, I, I can I can just pledge to anybody and everybody that's, looking at this deal in the, in the event that this is passed and we're allowed to build this sign, I know ultimately it, it would be non-offensive and I think not problematic for anybody and everybody around it. I mean that. So, And, and um, we're more than happy to um, meet with uh, the neighbors and show the mitigation. This has to go to city council. Even if you approve it, conditional uses don't, but this has to go to the city council. Um, so I think that, uh, you know, we can, we can demonstrate um, let's see. Uh, I need to get to the picture that's sh sh uh, looking from the house to the south. There. And you can see that there's a sign right in the visual line of that existence, existing residence. Uh, we're not going to add anything to this area that isn't, doesn't already exist. So with that, I'll be glad to answer any questions. And if you have any questions for... Uh, questions uh, for Gordon. the applicant or agent? Okay, hearing none. Uh, is there anyone present who would like to speak on this item from the public? Okay, please go forward, state your name and address, and you have three minutes. Scott McPhail, 4045 North Hydraulic. I have the residential property that is, or represent the three residential properties just to the north. Uh, first, I want to say that um, DAB, just reiterate, I guess, that DAB did unanimously uh, vote against any sign on, the, on this property. And they even made a comment on the, about how the report seemed to be very biased in favor of the petitioner. Um, the color picks are all nice. The only one that really counts is the drawing that has the, um, looks like the blueprint. 
on the back. And it is 150 feet. It is not 200 feet if you get your glasses back um, to the south. It'll be approximately, since now, since it's a V sign, it'll be within 25 feet of Mr. Davidson's backyard, 125 feet. It's 185 feet to my back door. We're talking a 14 by 48 sign. The trees that they so kindly decided to leave there are my trees. The trees were there before, so moving the sign didn't make a difference. The petitioner already cut his trees down long before this to prepare for the sign. The trees that we're talking about are deciduous, deciduous trees. So in the winter, it's going to be immaterial. They're going to lose their leaves anyway. Spot zoning like this only benefits one person, the petitioner. The petitioner does not even live there. This is an investment property. He doesn't care about the effects of the neighborhood because it is not in his neighborhood. The, um, the report does not take in the character of the neighborhood. It is residential. It has been residential for numerous years. Nobody is going to come in there and buy the quarter acre lot so they can put their industrial complex in there. We zoned our house residential. I zoned the property north of my house that I own residential and the house in front residential to try to protect ourselves from atrocities like this. The, uh, this, the city is supposed to take in the character of the property. They're supposed to preserve the value of the property, and this does none. The light emitted from that property is in direct. There will be light pollution from that. There is no way around it. And if you look on there at the bottom, it even gives you the statute that it that affects on the, on the handout that we handed out. I could be up here for, for a lot longer. It looks like I'm out of, town, uh, out of time. But I just ask you, how would you like this in your backyard? I don't care how perfect the sign is, how would you like a, this atrocity in your backyard? Thank you. My name's Dorothy Jacobs MacPhail, and I wanted to make some clarifications. The houses have been there since the 1920s, so that's over 100 years. So I don't look for them to be wiped out anytime soon. And um, if anyone drives to that area, they will see that it is housing. There are houses up and down the streets, and the sign that they're referring to is 800 feet, according to the report, is 800 feet away. And if you look on both sides of the sign, there is no residential properties. So that is an irrelevant point because there are no residential properties. And as they said earlier, um, the sign, sorry, this is not correct. Like they said, it was whacked off. And so <clears throat> these trees do not, they don't exist anymore. So they are not a light buffer. And the uh, promise of leaving that can't be said because they, they are not on the property of the, this is our property. They're not on the property of the other people that want the sign. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Anyone else present? Any questions for the speaker? Anyone else who would like to speak to this topic, please come forward.
Uh, my name is Craig Davidson. I live at 1540 East 39th Street North. I also own what is left of 1528 39th Street North. That would be the house that was tore down for the highway. Um, I'm just going to keep this simple. It's too big, too close, 30 feet, 60 feet. It doesn't matter. I'm going to see it. It is 150 feet. Uh, that north fence and that walnut tree, my property pin is six inches north of that fence. I own the fence. The tree sticks through maybe an inch or two. The tree's mine. Yes, they can trim what's on their side. It doesn't matter um, if that's what they want to do. 150 feet is too close. The, the sign to the south is 700 feet away. That is a lot of difference. That is a big difference. And yes, I noticed that one too. But there's no houses underneath it. There's going to be a house underneath this one. It doesn't need to be there. It doesn't belong. There's only 25 feet from where they, from my property pen, to where they pinned and staked out for, for this survey. It, the sign's going to go past my shop and be behind the walnut tree. No matter where I'm at on my property, I'm going to see it. Does anybody have any questions for me? Any questions? Thank you for your testimony. All right. Thank you. Is there anyone participating virtually who would like to speak on this item? Okay, I'll bring it back to the commission. Uh, you've had your time already. I'm sorry. Uh, rebuttal from the agent. Did you want to say anything else? Did you want to say anything else? Right. Just one thing I would say you have is two I, minutes. I, thank you. Uh, go ahead. Come on, go up, ahead. Jeff. Jeff. Join him. Jeff, come on. And um, I've never said we were keeping the trees. I don't. I'm looking through my reports. Uh, the trees are there. We cite that the trees are there, but we never say that those are our trees. So, just wanted to clarify that. Go ahead. I, I just want to reiterate. And I, you know, I respect everybody's opinion. Um, I'm used to doing these things. I, I get, I hear this a lot, and I just, I get that it's close to the residences that are on industrial property, but I can honestly say the sign that, what is it to the south? The the sign that's 700 feet away. You see that sign? I mean, you're all you're going to see is the column of this sign, unless you walk out there and just want to look up. I mean, and that's just how. It's, I have a bunch of these next to homes. I have no problem, not one problem with not one human being that lives anywhere near one of these because of the way we the light is diffused. It's not shined out. Again, if it was 30 foot, I wouldn't even walk in here and ask because you would be looking at the sign. It's close. I'm sorry. Can you tell me the circumference of the pole at its base? Uh, I build a 42 inch column. 42 inch circumference. Yes, ma'am. And it's black metal? It's all black, gloss black. All and over. how does that compare to a typical telephone pole's circumference? Do you know that? It's bigger. But it's, I mean, from a distance, it's not huge at all. I mean, it's not. Okay. Um, but again, I mean, look, I respect everybody's opinion. I understand. I'm used to, you know, it's kind of a, a touchy thing sometimes. But I, I just know that if this sign gets in there, there's not going to be, you know, the light shining on people. There's not going to be a sign in your face upsetting you everything's going to be up above it i mean I, frankly i mean it sounds crazy to say to everybody that i have a sign close to they like the sign they don't dislike it um so I, you know that's just the truth that's all i can say um okay your time is up okay Th any question from the commission for the speaker if none i'll bring the discussion back to the commission mr mckay there seems to be a difference in opinion on the zoning you got here on our printout industrial the people talk said there's residential what is the what is the true zoning the the zoning of the property is general industrial the, these residential properties here are zoned general industrial they are developed with residential homes I understand but people said that they got 
the property on their piece of property and some property around its own single family. The this properties to the, to the north. The properties to the north. These properties right here are zoned single family residential with single family homes. So the residential properties to the north are zoned residentially. The residential properties along 39th Street are zoned general industrial. I have a question. Go ahead, Commissioner Cunningham. Um, when you first started your presentation, you said that the sign couldn't be more than 300 feet to residential property. Is that, does that matter that it's, that it's uh, zoned industrial? No, it does not. The way the sign code is written is it says residential zoning as well as residential uses. Okay. Okay. And that is why they're asking for the exception is they want to place a sign that is less than 300 feet. Commissioner Warren. And oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Commissioner Cunningham. Well, it's very interesting that it's that that Mr. Ferris calls it an exception, but it's written up as a as a conditional use. And then the other comment is using number five as a relative gain to public health. How 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 did we come to that? That it that it's a gain to public health to have a sign in your backyard. The staff report does not address that finding. Oh, it doesn't. Okay. I read it somewhere. I'm sorry, hmm. Mr. Ferris. Okay, thank you. Your time to comment thank is you. over. All right, thank you. Can I ask for a clarification from one or both of our attorneys present? The statutory language says a conditional use as an exception. So every conditional use is an exception. But am I remembering correctly that there are sometimes exceptions that are not conditional uses? I believe that's technically correct. We treat it, if I'm not mistaken, JR would have been the best person to comment on this, but my understanding is that we treat this as a conditional use, but your statement is correct. It's, it's technically an exception. And the difference is the, thank you for bailing me out, JR. JR Cox, Metropolitan Planning Zoning Administrator for the city and the county of Sedgwick. And this is not a conditional use and is not a special exception under zoning. This is a special review under our sign code. There's a specific section in our sign code that addresses the purpose of this and the conditions uh, that it would be approved under. So it is neither a con, conditional use, nor a special exception. Special exceptions are not in our zoning code anymore. They were at one time. They still exist under state statute. We do not use them. This is specifically under the sign code. Hmm. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Yo, oh, I'm sorry, Commissioner Warren. As, if you drive down the road and you look, this is a place where you would expect to see a sign like that. I mean, this this looks right. It looks like it's the way that it should be. Uh, you know, that's what you see miles to the north, what you see to the south. So I would move to approve with per staff comment. I have a motion to approve. Second. I have a second from Commissioner Green. Discussion? I live with one of these in my backyard. Don't notice it except on the day that they put it up. Um, I think the height is a, an issue. When it gets higher, it becomes more invisible in my experience. Other comments or discussion? <clears throat> I'll would call then for a vote. All those in favor, aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. Nay. One nay. Uh, do we need to do a roll call? OK, roll call, please. Yes, ma'am. This is on the motion to approve per staff comments. Fox? Aye. Duell? Yes. McKay? Yes. Green? Aye. Bill Johnson? Yes. Blick? 
Aye. Nix. Aye. Foster. Aye. Warren. Aye. Joe Johnson. Aye. Miles. Aye. Hartman is absent. Cunningham. No. Williams Bay. Motion passes 11 2. Is that accurate? Ma'am, I had 12 1. 12 1, okay. 12 1. Yours was a I. Thank you. Uh, at this time, we will move. Um, recess from the Planning Commission meeting to enter the Board of Zoning Appeals. I would call for a motion for approval of the April 21 BZA meeting minutes. So moved. I have a motion from Mr. Green. Second. Second from Commissioner Foster. I note that uh, Commissioner McKay was absent from that meeting. I'll call for ayes for those who will accept the motion. Aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, motion passes 12 0, 1 abstention. Uh, now we will hear the uh, case BZA 2022 0038. We will hear BZA 2022 0040. Case BZA 2022 0041 is the one that relates to the case we just heard. Um, and then BZA 2022 0042. Uh, as we get to that item, we'll determine if we need to hear a staff report or if we can take a motion on that case when it arises. So if I could call for a staff report on BZA 2022 0038, please. Uh, Philip. Do you want to take a moment and determine if the applicant or agent is? Is the applicant or agent present? Yes, we're present. OK. Thank you, Madam Chair. Philip Ziebenberg, and again, for the record with planning staff. BZA 2238 is a variance request to increase the allowable square footage for a pole sign uh, on a property at uh, 311 South Hillside. The applicant is requesting a, to permit a 31% increase in the permitted area from 32 square feet to 42 square feet for one on-site pole sign on property zone general office at 30 or 311 South Hillside. The applicant is also requesting that a portion of the sign be allowed to have an LED or electronic message center component on both sides. The request to increase the sign area requires the variance. The request for the LED portion of the sign can be approved by administrative adjustment. However, since the variance was required, both requests are being presented and the board will need to provide separate recommendations um, for each one. And we outline that in your report and I will guide you through that when we get to that section. The sign code requires in general office that the area square, the square footage of the area for a sign not exceed 32 square feet for a single tenant um, lot. This lot only has one tenant, so they uh, are only allowed 32 square feet. Um, they are proposing 42 square feet, as we mentioned before. The sign height will only be approximately 15 feet, which is lower than the 22 feet in height that they are allowed, so that's not an issue in this request. The sign code allows electronic message centers and or LED signs to be permitted in GEO by administrative adjustment. And as you see farther down in the report, that many properties in the vicinity, many office uses within the vicinity have LED signs associated with their property. The, Paul, can we go to the sign exhibit slide, please? The one that shows what the sign will look like. Thank you. As you can see on the exhibit, the, the dimensions are hard to read here, but I have them in the staff report. That 30 square feet of the proposed 42 square foot 
sign will be the LED component. That's this section of the sign right here on the bottom sign. And the remaining 12 square feet, so a one and a half by approximately eight foot um, portion of the sign will be a static sign that uh, states the identification for the law office. The applicant is saying that the reason they need the, va the variance is because if you go to back to the aerial, there's trees that are located on the property to the north that provide some visual obstruction for drivers traveling southbound on South Hillside. And they state that the increase in size will help increase the visual, um, the ability to see the sign and ability to identify that the law office is located at that location. Properties surrounding it on the hillside portion of the site are all general office with office uses. Properties behind on the other side of the alley fronting Lorraine Avenue are two family residentially zoned with single family homes. Within a quarter mile, like I said, multiple properties have LED signs. Staff really does not have concern with the opportunity to provide an LED sign for the law office. As with variances, we have to determine if the five criteria or the board's responsibility is determining if the five criteria by which variances must be approved actually exist. So the first criteria is the uniqueness of the property. The applicant states that the property is unique due to the abutting property to the north having the six trees within two feet of the sidewalk. The applicant claims that these provide a visual obstruction for all clients or prospective clients traveling south on South Hillside. They state that the increased size of the sign will help alleviate the impediment created by the large trees. Paul, if you want to go to the site photos, please, we'll kind of use these as a reference point. This is taken through my car as I was driving. I don't recommend you do that. I'm not condoning taking pictures out of your windshield when you're driving. These are the trees that the applicant is talking about. This is the facade of the office building in question, and they have a banner sign that clearly states Pistotnik Law on, on the building. The sign does not have a pole sign right now. The sign does not have any other sign near the right of way. They do have the building sign that can be seen through the hole in the um, trunks of the trees. It is staff's opinion that they have not demonstrated how an increase in size by 31% to 42 square feet will increase the visibility of the office building when there's not currently a pole sign on the property that they can prove is invisible at 32 square feet, in addition to the fact that you can see the building sign as they're traveling down South Hillside. So staff's opinion and this criteria is that there hasn't been a demonstration that the increase in size um, will actually improve visibility over 32 square feet, considering the top 12 square feet are the only portion of the sign that will actually identify the location as the Pistotnik Law Office is, and likely the LED portion of the sign will be displaying messages related to the business and not necessarily the business itself. The second criteria of granting the variance will not adversely affect the rights of adjacent property owners. The applicant states that the increase in area would not adversely affect the right of the property's owners. It will not change the obstruction to the north. Property to the south has a ground sign, and so the proposed height of the sign will not obstruct the view of the sign to the south. Staff agrees with those points. However, as we've stated before, they have not demonstrated how the additional 10 square feet actually will improve the visibility of the sign or of the property uh, when there is not an existing pole sign that's obstructed and you can see the building sign on the from South Hillside. In addition, if this is approved and since there has been no variance approved in the uh, recent vicinity, um, approval of a variance for this could encourage other property owners in the area to request variances for increases in size um, and potentially set a precedent for approval. Third criteria is that the strict application of the code will constitute an unnecessary hardship on the applicant. The applicant states that the, applica the application of the code would result in this hardship uh, because of the obstruction of the trees on the north prevents clients from viewing the signage. Roughly half the persons of the people traveling on South Hillside would not be able to view the sign until they are nearly past the property. In addition, the law office currently owns an LED board that sizes correctly to the variance request. 
Without the variance, the law office, of it, law office would have to purchase another LED board, creating a significant unnecessary ex expense. Again, staff's opinion on this is they have not have demonstrated how the increase in the sign will increase the visibility. The size of the LED board, which is 30 square feet, fits the standard size that is allowed in GEO. They could use the LED sign to advertise for their office in addition to other messages and would not need the additional 12 square feet on the top of the sign to advertise the law offices. In addition, purchasing a sign that does not meet the sign code requirements and then asking for a, a variance to allow you to use the sign that you purchased, staff feels that this is a hardship that is self-imposed. Fourth criteria says that the, the variance will not adversely affect the public health, safety, morals, welfare, convenience, prosperity, general welfare, and harmonious development. The applicant states that it will not have the adverse effects on these criterion. Um, it will not, it'll be, they consider it a, a minor impact, minor variance, and it will not have an impact on the public. Staff opinion is that it will have an adverse on the harmonious development of the community. Uh, there are no other variances um, approved in the vicinity. And so by granting a variance approval at this location could invite or encourage other variance requests and set a precedent for approval. And finally, the last one is that it has to be the spirit and intent and general spirit of the code. They say that it is in the general and spirit and intent of the code. Staff opinion is that the Sign code is there to create a uniform appearance within the community and less intensive zoning districts are permitted lesser amounts of signage, both in height and in size. The applicant is requesting an increase of 31%. A variance can only be granted if the five criteria discussed in the staff report are met. The applicant has not demonstrated the need for the additional 12 square feet. So here's where we get to the recommendation. There's a recommendation on the LED portion. Again, that could be have done administratively. Um, the LED board does not automatically allow it to be bigger. They can just have an LED component. Staff has no issue with that. We have three findings in there that show we have no issue with an LED sign on there. So one of the, we'll have to have two motions, one for the LED and then one for the actual increase in sign area. So if we do approve the sign area, there are three, four conditions of approval. In your staff report, just for time's sake, I'm not going to go over those. Again, that's really not much of the argument as part of this staff report. The second item we need to consider is the variance request. Um, it is in staff's opinion that the uh, request does not meet the five criteria. In your motion this morning or this afternoon, if you feel that it does, it needs to be clearly stated in your motion that you feel it does meet the five criteria and provide reasons why. Um, if it is in the board's opinion that it does meet the five criteria. Staff does provide conditions of approval related to general conformance to the approved elevation and site plan. Um, sign will be not be located in any easement or project over a right of way unless proper permissions were obtained um, and that they obtain all necessary sign permits and that the sign be erected in within one year. While you're here, um, Paul, we're just gonna um, cycle through the sign images um, if you're going to go to the next image. So again, as we're going closer down um, hillside, you can again see the building sign of the Pistotnik Law Office. Um, their pole sign would be located on the other side of the drive, I believe. Um, either way, the sign of the building is visible um, from hillside. Next picture. This is looking south, and you can see the Pistotnik Law Office office building is here. These trees do um, get very close to the street. Next picture. This is looking south of the property. This is the ground sign that they mentioned that will not be visually obstructed by their sign if it's constructed. Next picture. This is looking to the southeast. There's an office across the street. Next picture. And that's all I have for you. I can stand for any questions. Any questions for Philip from the commission? Uh, Commissioner Foster, go ahead. Just for clarification, Philip, do we need to vote on the LED sign aspect of this given that it's an administrative adjustment? 
Do you want us to vote on it? Anyway? Yes, we, we are processing them together so that they did not have to use two separate actions. They submitted one application. They did not have a separate fee for the administrative adjustment. Knowing it's a lesser ask, you also have the authority to approve that as well. All right, thank you. That, that helps. Any other questions for Philip? Then we'd call the applicant or agent. Brian Collignan, 2130 North Clear Creek, Wichita, 67230. Um, I think from our standpoint, if the LED sign is approved, perhaps the most logical thing would be to erect the LED sign and then we get a visual of uh, whether there is a, a blockage from the tree or whether the LED sign is sufficient in and of itself. I don't, I'm, I'm a personal injury attorney, not a zoning attorney. I don't know if there's a procedure where we can just continue the one aspect of whether the sign square footage should be um, increased and proceed with just the LED sign and have you guys vote on that. And then we put it up, see if there's an issue and renew our request. If there is an issue, if there's no issue, then the request would not be renewed. Uh, but from a standpoint of our position right now is just simply if we can get the LED sign up, we can live with that. So am I understanding correctly that you're taking away your request for the additional signage space at this time? Well, if I take it away, does that mean I got to apply and do a new fee and everything? Yes, it does. It? Yes, it does. Okay. Um, well, then we might as well have you get well. I so we'll proceed vote and vote on that. both items and okay. Right. Any okay. other? What? You have additional comments to make at this time. You have no. I guess some time if you are voting. The... Could you speak to why the additional forty-two square feet would make a difference? 12, additional 12 from square a feet, I'm sorry. Of, there's a photograph they've submitted titled Looking South Towards Site from okay. Vehicle Number 2. And that photograph does show that once you can see the sign, you're, you can't be but 40 feet away from the turn in. And that's where the larger sign would give us more viewing from further away because it would uh, the obstruction would be less in less of an impediment I guess so from that standpoint it would uh, permit people driving southbound to see the firm and have enough time to slow and turn in okay I that answered my question thank you any other questions okay. for the applicant uh, is there anyone? Yeah. Okay. S go ahead. I I just wondered. It, it, <clears throat> I don't know how I missed it, but how tall is this sign going to be? Is it going to be about the same as this red and white one showing now? They propose it to be oh, fifteen point wow. two feet. So the the sign height is under the allowable height by the sign code. The sign code allows a twenty two foot sign. They're proposing a fifteen point two foot sign. Mm hmm. And the, their building is about 25 feet tall facade, maybe. So it's not going to be taller than the building. No. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? Mr. Can you use your microphone, please? Okay, sorry. Philip, could you show us approximately where that sign would be located? Can you go to the site plan, Paul? So here's their frontage and the let me see how I apologize that I need to review this one more time before I state something. So their sign would be located right here after their driveway. So that would be in front of the, the sign that's on the building now. It would be it looks like it's fairly in line with their south building line 
Okay, any other questions? Is there anyone from the public who would like to speak on this item? Anyone participating virtually who would like to speak on this item? Then I'd bring it back to the commission. And remember, we want to take this as two parts, the LED sign first, and then the additional square footage. Madam Chair, I'd like to make a motion to approve the LED sign. Motion from Commissioner Green. Second. Second from multiple. We'll take it to Commissioner Duell gets that one. Um, any discussion? All in favor of approval of the LED sign with staff comments? Say aye. 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 Any opposed, nay? Hearing none, that motion passes 12-0, 13-0. Uh, now, discussion of the increased signage area of 12 feet. This requires additional comments of meeting the five criteria necessary. Uh, Commissioner Warren. I move to deny the request of additional 12 square foot. I have a motion to deny. Second. Second, Second from Mr. Williams Bay and yes. If I could translate that a little bit, okay. I think what's, what's meant is that you find that it does not meet all five of the criteria necessary for a variance. Right. So that, can we, will you accept that additional that wordage? Said, yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, would you, Commissioner Williams Bay, accept the additional language for that motion? Yes. Thank you. Uh, all in, any discussion on the motion? All in favor, signify by aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Um, motion denied, 13-0. BZA case 2022 0040. Uh, Philip, will you continue, please? Yes, ma'am. BZA 2240 is a unique case. It is not a variance request. It is a appeal for an administrative interpretation. Background to this story that set this up is the property is located at 3810 North Woodlawn. As you can see on your screen, it's northeast corner of 37th and Woodlawn. It's zone limited commercial. In the past, it did receive permission to have a billboard on the property. It had various things, not enough frontage within, res you know, a certain distance within residential properties, and they were allowed to have the billboard. Um, Paul, if you would just want to go to the first um, site photograph, please. I think that'll be helpful. Keep going. There you go. So they, they, a billboard is existing. It's an off-site sign um, allowed to advertise off-site good services and messages. Um, on August 11th of 2022, the applicant, the property owner, received a notice of, via, of a violation from the Zoning Enforcement Division um, for using the off-site sign to advertise an on-site use which is an expert auto care center. And the issue with that is the, the development standards for an on-site sign, like you would see for the Sonic in the background, are significantly more restrictive in terms of height and area, much like the variants we were just talking about. Um, an off-site sign can be taller, it can be bigger, and really this is a, a situation of fairness. If this property is used to advertise for on-site services above and beyond the ability of other users around, other on-site locations for Dillon's, Walgreens, Sonic, other things, they could, you could say they have a competitive advantage. They're just be getting treated differently. They have the ability to have a broader spectrum of advertisement that is not afforded to other properties around them for on-site advertisement. To best understand this discussion, let's dive into what the um, definitions are. An on-site sign means a sign which conveys a message or advertisement directly related to the lawful use of the premises on which it is located. An off-site sign means a sign delivering a message or advertisement which is unrelated to the activities conducted on the premises or the products sold or manufactured thereon. The 
advertisement in question is the one that you see on the screen. Paul, if you want to back up to the actual image of it. It advertises a $10 off an oil change for an expert auto care center, technically located at 150 South Washington in Wichita. The contention with this is technically they are advertising a service and an offer available at a different expert auto care center location, not at the one at 3810 North Woodlawn. This offer supposedly is only good for the one location at 150 South Washington. That being said, Paul, you want to jump to the last two pictures? Yesterday morning, staff went out and took two pictures of existing advertisements. You can see the, it's a, the example advertisement we just looked at, but the address is not listed. The next picture says expert auto care center now open on Saturday. No discussion of any specific location that's not 3810 North Woodlawn. The applicant provided a appeal narrative. It's in your staff report. I broke it down in generality. Um, they provided a discussion of the definitions. They provided a, some understanding that the billboard is owned separately from the expert auto care center. The expert auto care center contracts with the sign owner to advertise for businesses that are not his or not at this location. This sign does advertise off-site things in our site pictures that you saw in your um, staff report. There are other cycles of this sign that do have off-site properties. Um, the applicant notes that the sign supposedly is advertising for a business six miles away. Um, the applicant states that the sign is advertising for a message that is not directly related to the lawful use of the premises. The applicant provided some possible scenarios based on the interpretation of the zoning administrator, possible on-site sign scenarios and off-site sign scenarios. I, really those are, they have to be dealt with at a, on an individual basis. They are separately interpreted um, to try to come up with scenarios based on this particular interpretation, really sites are different locations, advertisements are different things. There's a lot of different variables that would have to go into regarding that. And really I can let him provide explanation of what those scenarios are to help you understand his perspective on that. They say that the specific advertisement is a special offer that is only available at the 150 South Washington location. Um, as we saw from a picture taken yesterday that they have a cycle of the sign that does not provide that address. Um, and the sign is owned and operated by Kansas Billboard LLC and not the property owner. So we're trying to make a distinction that the expert auto care center does not own the sign. They just contract with the sign for advertisements elsewhere. Staff analysis of this, um, objectively the sign subject graphic does list an address for an offsite location if it's the proper one going through the cycle. Um, the size and location of the address is not a prominent feature on the graphic. There's nothing on the graphic that states that the special offer being advertised is only at the off-site location. The advertised special offer for expert auto care center, or the special offer and the expert auto care center are the prominent features of the graphic, which is displayed directly above an expert auto care center facility. It is reasonable to conclude that the average consumer of the graphic sign is not aware that the advertised special offer is only available at the off-site location. It is also reasonable to conclude that the average consumer of the graphic with prompting from the sign could patron expert auto care center at 3810 North Woodlawn due to the location of the sign and advertisement being directly above the building. The example scenarios described by the applicant and our alternative situations would have, would have to be interpreted independently by the zoning administrator. The way this can function is really you have two options in terms of a recommendation. You can recommend to uphold the appeal of the applicant and say that it is in the opinion of the Board of Zoning Appeals that it is truly not being used as an on-site sign, um, that the graphic with the um, off-site location is truly an off-site graphic. And should that be 
the opinion of the board this afternoon, staff does have some recommendations of conditions that that particular copy and graphic, that the one that we see on the screen right now, be edited to make it more clear that it actually is a service offered only at the offsite location, not at the location directly below the sign. In addition, that it would also conform to all the other requirements of the sign code. The other option you guys have is uphold the interpretation of the zoning administrator, which is to say that they are using it as an on-site sign that is advertising for on-site purposes as well, therefore in violation of the sign code because it does not meet the size and height requirements of an on-site sign. And in that, the condition of approval would be that they are required to correct the violation within 30 days of this board's decision and that all other requirements of the notice of violation dated 8-11-2022 be enforced and complied with. So basically saying, you you basically got an extension of your need to correct the sign from this board's decision, but let the um, governing language of that notice of violation letter um, go forward from there and be the enforcing, being the enforcing item. I wanna make a couple corrections in the um, staff report, just pause it. In the very first paragraph, the, the sign is located on the west side of the building, not the east side of the building. Um, apologize for that. Um, I think that was it. I can stand for questions that you might have. Questions for Philip, Commissioner Foster. In the 2019 variance case that originally allowed this sign, was there a condition as part of that that if they violated one of the five conditions, the, the variance was no longer active or again that that was similar to what we just um, talked about with the um, conditional use case was a special review to allow the offsite sign um, the offsite sign was permitted and now it's under the enforcement of the um, of the sign code which Truthfully, I don't know the, the grit of the enforcement of okay they're using it as an on-site sign um, perhaps uh, JR could speak to that or um, maybe uh, Jeff Van Zandt, but there are teeth in enforcement in terms of what reparations would have to happen if they are using their sign improperly and refuse to comply um, with enforcement of making corrections. Thank you. Other questions for Philip or Jeff, did you want to? Okay. Uh, hearing none, we will call forth the Agent. Seen you guys in a very long time. And again, now it's, uh, again, my name's Craig Ferris. Uh, I represent uh, Kansas Billboards. Uh, this sign was incorrectly notified um, that it was in violation. That notice should have gone to Kansas Billboard, not to um, the property owner, because they have no uh, authority really to do anything other than not pay for advertising. Um, so that's neither here nor there. I will tell you that whatever this board is findings is, we will comply with. If you disagree with my analysis, um, the, those ads will immediately be taken off. Um, and I concur with Philip that uh, if uh, you do find that we uh, are not in violation, that uh, we would predominantly display the addresses as you know, I don't review these copies, and I'll make sure that in the future I make sure that those copies uh, do have those. And I think that's an important point because uh, when you look at what an on-site sign is, an on-site advertises that business. Uh, the offers that were prescribed and what we intend to do in the future, uh, if it's allowed to go forward, will only and. Again, Philip's recommendation, uh, I, I concur with. We will only be able to do those things that are not um, on this property. So if it's a coupon, it's only valid in the other location. Uh, this location is his new location, the one on, on um, um, Washington. He's trying to promote that. He's trying to build that location. Um, and that's why he wanted to be able to advertise that and make special offers for that location only. I think when you look at the language of what, uh, and, I, and I do disagree with Philip, that it is pertinent to understand that if you find 
for staff today that you in effect are saying that uh, Eddie's uh, uh, car, because they have Eddie's, 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 and they have four or five different ones, they can advertise any of their services at any of their locations on their on-site signs. Because that's what you are saying today is that if a business is on that sign and they have other locations, they're in effect the same as being at that location. Um, that is what you would be saying today, uh, regardless of uh, the, the, my disagreement with staff, is that you can't say that a business on can't advertise other businesses on site, but they can't advertise businesses off site either. You have to say one or the other. It can't be both. Uh, so that's why I think it's important that you consider what the ramifications of your decision is today, because I know for a fact that there will be cases where on-site signs will be advertising businesses that are owned and have the same name as that business on other locations. Uh, so, because I have clients who have already asked me about this and I told them I can't do it. Um, but if you're telling me today that a different address is the same business, then I'm going to tell them, yeah, you can advertise that because the planning uh, committee or the Board of Zoning Appeals has said that there is a differentiation and that if a business is different address and you're making a present a uh, advertising even if you have different addresses or whatever it doesn't matter so i think it is important that you are saying something today um, based on that i think that the fact that this business offers the same thing if i had a uh, based on the interpretation of what is in the staff report if this loc if this sign was on a different um, auto repair place, I couldn't advertise any auto repair place because that service would then be offered at that location. And that's what exactly they're saying in their report. So it's, it is a slippery slope and it's very rare occurrence. Uh, so I don't think there's a major setback. So if you find that um, what this sign is advertising is a location other than this location and stiff, stiff, specify, excuse me, my mouth's getting dry, I should have got a drink in between presentations, uh, specify that it can only, that the addresses have to be predominant. I have no problem with that and would concur with that. With that, I'd be glad to answer any questions you might have. Commissioner Foster. Greg, just to clarify, the land itself, this parcel is owned by Mr. Faisal, but the sign is owned by Kansas Billboards, LLC? Correct, and they have no relationship whatsoever, other well, than, they, other than they lease the ground. It, well, and they have a contractual re relationship to do the advertising. So Mr. Faisal has a contract with Kansas Billboards to advertise his expert auto business at all five, lo well, all five locations, which he owns all of them, correct? Yes. Except this one. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> Other questions, uh, Commissioner Warren? Well, I guess I've got a, a question here that, I, that shouldn't involve us, but it, 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 we're getting drug, drug into it, and that's uh, truth in advertising. If he's advertising another business, it looks the same, it sounds the same, but the address is different, and the, op and the offers are different, then we're defrauding the, the, uh, the public. So it's, to me, either it, it's it's if it's one business and they're all doing the same thing, then just don't put the address on because it's going to fit all of them. They do. But if you start putting different businesses on there, then it's it's not an on-site sign; it's an off-site sign. It's pretty simple. Other questions? Do we have anyone from the public who wants to speak to this item? I don't believe this is a public hearing, is it? Oh, that's right. I'm sorry. Let us bring, yeah, that's not a, yeah. Um, what's the, let's discuss. let's discuss, yes, thank you. Okay. Mr. Foster. Um, this original variance, and I realize it's, this is different, but there are the five conditions we have to and one of them is unnecessary hardship and another is spirit and intent of the sign regulations. I don't think requiring the owner of this sign to actually use it properly as an off-site sign is 
an unnecessary hardship. But most important from my perspective is I think this is a clear case of somebody trying to game the system. Regulating signage is important. It's communities that don't regulate signage become awful eyesores and I think it's important that we regulate signage in the spirit and intent of the sign regulations. And I think the teeny tiny little print with the address of the other branch of this business down in the corner does not meet the spirit and intent of the sign regulations. Um, I will be, unless somebody else wants to, moving to, to deny, or to, to uphold the, excuse me, to um, support the staff. To deny the appeal, that's what I'll be moving, yes. Is that a motion? Does anybody else want to speak on this? Then I would move that we deny the appeal. Um, clarify that we're, the options we were given that might help make it cleaner, if it would be, uh, this is on page four of the staff report, to uphold the interpretation of the zoning administrator, which would be to require compliance with the notice of violation you want me to read the whole thing? It's, I think if, Okay. I would like to move that we uphold the interpretation of the zoning administrator, which will mean that the applicant shall be required to correct the violation within 30 days of the board's decision. All other requirements of the notice of violation dated 8-11-2022 shall be enforced and complied with. I have a motion. Is there a second? Second. Second from Commissioner Warren. Any discussion from the commission? Uh, call for a vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. Hearing none, the motion passes 13-0. Oh, an update on that is I believe it's 12-0 because I believe Mr. Blick left. Mr. Blick has, is, okay. Um, Mr. Blick, are you still <laughs> present? Okay, the mic is off, but we see your face. We we recorded that he was absent for a period okay. of time, so okay. If we change the outcome, okay. Either way. Motion passes twelve one. Abstention, we'll call it. Um, the next case relates to the signage case we heard at length. I'm going to ask if we could potentially have a motion. Uh, with or do we need a staff report? The motion is to or the question is whether the sign can be raised in height. And this is uh, BZA 2022 0041 uh, for the height of the offsite sign that we heard about in our 4.3 case. Could, would it be possible just to make a motion to grant the? Uh, the request. I would accept that motion. And public comment? No, oh, public comment would be the question. That's correct. No public comment because we're in the BZA. See, we're both getting confused. I feel better already. Um, no, no need for public comment. So we have a motion from Mr. Green, a second from Mr. McKay. Uh, to grant the increase in height of the sign located a quarter mile east of 37th Street North on North Hydraulic. Uh, any discussion of that motion? Hearing none, I'll call for a vote. Uh, all those in favor, aye. 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 Any opposed, nay. Hearing none, motion passes 13-0. And then the final case, uh, BZA 2022, for the BZA, uh, case BZA 2022, 0042. Um, Christina, in short, this recommendation is? 
Can we take it on consent? Can we? Yes. Yeah, yeah, this is to increase the height of a, of a screening fence by one foot yes. from nine to ten. That's correct. Is okay. anyone interested in um, making a... I move that we uh, grant the request. Have a motion to okay. approve a second from Mr. Nix. Uh, any discussion? Yes, staff we'll, comment? We'll interpret that as having met that it finds that the five conditions are in place for a variant. Yes. Uh, I had my microphone off when I said that. Sorry. <laughs> okay. We have uh, additional language added to the motion and a sec agreement with the second. All in favor, indicate by aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Hearing none, passes 13-0. That uh, we will now adjourn the BZA. And that returns us to our next case. The time is now 4 o'clock. Um, we have this patient group of public members who've been here. I would like to say we'd continue with the next case and then take a break as soon as we've got our two remaining cases. I think then we're done. Can we bear with it? Right? If you need to go somewhere before you can listen, do that on your own. OK. And we are losing one member at 4.30. So we'll try to proceed. Pardon me? Yeah, we have several left. We'll see where we're at. OK. Uh, conditional, let's show of hands how many are here for uh, 2022 000 36? And how many are here for 2022 0041? OK, so let's go proceed with those two cases. Um, Con 22 000 36, Aaron, please. Provide your staff report. Good afternoon, Erin Ebach friend with the planning department. Con 2022 0026 is a conditional use request to prevent an event center in the county on property zoned RR rural residential. Um, the site is generally located west of South Hydraulic Avenue and on the north side of East 79th Street South. The subject property is located. Um, in the in unincorporated Cedric County within the city of Hayesville's urban area of influence and subdivision jurisdiction. Currently, the subject site is developed with a um, 3,985 square foot Quonset hut that has been constructed as a single family residence. Should this request be approved, the applicant intends to rent the facility and grounds for wedding receptions and similar events. Event centers in the county are permitted by right in the RR Rural Residential Zoning District on sites that are 20 acres or greater in size. Um, this, In this case, um, because the site is just over one acre, that is what has necessitated the conditional use. Um, the applicant, uh, so if should the conditional use be approved, the um, use would be subject to the supplementary use regulations outlined um, in the zoning code and the applicant is prepared to comply with these standards. However, they are requesting the waiver of the 100 foot setback um, requirement to be able to utilize the existing structure on the site. So the supplementary use regulations have a requirement that states that the um, structure in which the event um, will occur should be 100 foot away from all property lines. It does meet that on two sides. However, on um, to the east and west, it does not meet that 100 foot setback requirement. Any waiver of the supplementary use regulations must be recommended from approval for approval by the MAPC, but then would need final approval by um, the Board of County Commissioners. So should this request be approved, it would um, not be able to just be approved like a typical con. It would automatically have to go to BOCC. Yeah. Paul, could we go to this? Oh, we've got the zoning map right there. Perfect. Well, the subject property is zoned RR Rural Residential. The area surrounding the site is developed with suburban scale residential um, with an average density of one dwelling unit per um, 
39,000 square foot. Directly north of the subject site here in the, the light pink um, is the Orchard Point subdivision, which is zoned SF20 single family residential. And properties in this area are approximately one acre in size and are developed with ranch style single family residences. To the south of the subject property is another single family residential um, subdivision zoned SF20. Property abutting the subject site to the east is also zoned RR Rural Residential and is developed with a single family home. I do want to note that this LC property here at the corner, a portion of which um, it's, it's divided in half, so it's under two separate ownerships. This property owner um, also owns that LC portion, and that site is developed uh, with a sing or I'm sorry, a garage to serve that single family home. And then directly abutting the site to the west is um, another property zoned RR Rural Residential and developed with a single family residence. Due to the proximity of the proposed event facility, the surrounding residential properties could experience an increased level of noise and light pollution when events are held. Um, In regard to conformance to plans, the requested conditional use is found not to be in conformance with the Community Investments Plan or the City of Hayesville's Comprehensive Plan. The Hayesville Plan um, indicates that the preferred land use for this area is to be residential, and they outline two specific goals in their um, comprehensive plan related to residential is um, one being objectives four and five, um, which are to protect residential areas from incompatible land uses, and five, to provide a variety of housing choices for current and future populations. The uh, 2035 future growth um, map has designated um, the, the site as being in the small city urban growth area and um, general guidelines by the plans for development suggest that higher density residential uses and neighborhood serving commercial uses should buffer lower density residential uses from higher density commercial uses. The subject site here directly abuts suburban scale development and is without adequate, adequate buffering to transition and scale from an event center to single family residences. The Hazel Planning Commission heard this case on September 22nd and voted unanimously to recommend um, denial of the request. And then on October 3rd, the um, CAB 2 also voted to um, recommend denial. Should the and, and staff's recommendation is um, recommended to be denial for the request. Should the MAPC determine that this request be approved, staff has provided recommended conditions identified to help mitigate potential impacts. These include um, compliance with all of the supplementary use regulations with the exception of the 100 foot setback um, in regard to the, the structure to those property lines, as well as limits to hours of operation. So events at this site Sunday through Thursday would need to end by 10 p.m. And on Friday through Saturday, they would need to end at 11 p.m. The applicant has stated that they are amenable to all of staff's conditions um, should this be approved. And has also mentioned since the publishing of the staff report that um, they do plan to add some noise mitigating material to the interior walls of the structure to um, eliminate some of the um, audio impacts of its potential use. And then um, I did want to lastly note before we get to um, the slides that we did have a number of area residents that um, attended the meetings both on the 22nd and on October 3rd, um, providing a, a large amount of public comment and public comment that we have received since then in printed format has been provided for you all today. Paul, may we go to the next slide, please? Next slide, please. 
can see that is in the small growth, um, small city growth area. Next slide, please. This is a draft site plan for the site. Um, the applicant will need to work with, um, should this be approved, the applicant will need to work with fire to determine and, and building to determine the actual occupancy of the site. Once that is determined, then the parking would be based on the occupancy um, from that. Next slide, please. And again, a draft of parking spaces. Next slide, please. This is um, facing the site. So you can see the existing residential structure and the circle drive. Next slide, please. A closer image. Next slide, please. This is the um, abutting single family residence to the east. Next slide, please. This is an area of trees that buffer the site um, from the residential neighborhood to the south of the property. Next slide, please. Again, facing that residential neighborhood to the south. Next slide, please. You'll also see that a number of trees screen the site from the property to the west. Next slide, please. And then we are back to the aerial. With that, I am happy to answer any questions. Any questions for our staff? Yes, Commissioner Warren. Karen, I've got a, you may not be able to answer this question. No, nobody may be able to. Maybe the applicant or, or maybe the, some of the people that live in the area. What's the history of this building? It obviously was not originally built and designed to be a residence. So my understanding is so, that the site was built, um, or that residence was built, I think, around the 1960s. And it was a, the Quonset hut that was re kind of purposed into this residential use. Um, there was a request for a conditional use back in 2008 that was denied to permit vehicle sales on the site. And I believe that the applicant, well, the vehicle sales were not permitted, they continued to kind of um, do some vehicle storage that maybe was non-conforming um, to the single family, or I'm sorry, to the rural residential district. So there is a certificate of occupancy, though, for that as a residence? Do we yes. know that? That is my understanding is that, yes, it has been used as a residence um, since approximately the 1960s. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for staff? Uh, next, we would call the applicant. Hello, you have, give us your name and address, and then you have 10 minutes. Okay. My name is Tanya Tillman, and we have Brookstill Properties. Our, that address is 2020 West 21st Street North, 67203. We really do appreciate the opportunity to be able to talk with you. Um, our business is a local business that's family owned, and we all participate in it. So really, our heart is invested as well as our hard work into this project that we would like to do. Our goal and our plan for this um, this resident or this um, Quonset hut is to actually make a family friendly venue and event center where many happy occasions could be celebrated. Our event center will be purposed towards weddings, reunions, and anniversaries, and we won't ever have rock concerts or wild parties. That's not the clientele that we are trying to get to come to our um, venue. We really want our venue to be an asset for the community, and at present, we are cleaning up the bad conditions that were left by the previous owners. Um, there's over 100 tires, there's a burned down garage, buried trash. The aerial views of the property before we possessed it with the, the last owners, there shows about 37 cars and trucks that you can see from the aerial view. So. Obviously, this is a place that's been in disarray for a while and needs to be cleaned up and used for something better. <laughs> so we just wanted to show what the situation was with the previous owners. Also, they, as Aaron kind of indicated a little bit, they must they use this property to run uh, possibly an illegal chop shop, or an illegal towing service. That's what one of the inspectors had told us, that he was there many times because of that. So really what we're doing is trying to get it done the right way with the right permits and to have a good, proper, illegal business, legal business. So we know that the previous owners did not take care of the property and in fact they did the opposite by really not respecting the area or the community or the neighbors. 
in the area there, there's already a light limited commercial in the neighborhood, and actually it's just 140 feet from our site. If we are permitted this conditional use permit, we can only have an event center. With the already existing limited commercial property in the area, it could be developed with a large variety of commercial options that could be better, m more intense actually, and greater in scale than our event center will be. Also, there seem to be some concerns regarding traffic if we were permitted to have a venue. So we've noticed that 79th Street is what we sit on, and there is constant traffic on 79th Street. It's really not just like a neighborhood street. And we, I sat one day for 30 minutes and counted 144 cars that passed, so there was quite a few. Um, there are three event centers that we've found that although they do have different zoning, they operate in very close proximity to residences, neighborhoods. They operate sites that are similar in size to ours within the city of Hayesville and also in surrounding area. So we know that there are conditions the staff at MAPC has set forth to make this a successful event center, and we definitely are willing to follow that and put forth all their suggestions. Um, and as Aaron brought out too, something we're um, wanting to do or planning to do is to put in soundproof so that it wouldn't disrupt from the outside. So within just a few weeks, some of the things we're doing to make progress is the professional roofers will be there. They're gonna mend, seal, and color the roof, which of course the roof, it goes all the way over. So it will make quite a difference and a noticeable improvement in the property there. We'll have new windows put in. The yard will be completely cleaned up, as already stated, but that includes like all those tires getting rid of, which we hope will help with mosquito and possibly mice problems that comes from that kind of situation. There is much mold on the inside of the house, so under direction of professional remediators, we at present are having the mold removed and remediated. And we want to make it beautiful inside as well as outside. It is a very nice community that it's situated in, and we would like to make it nice to be able to fit the surroundings. We will be finishing out fencing on the west front side of property to have all three sides of the property with barriers between us and the neighbors. Besides that, we really do have a closure within the whole property except that area. We want this to be a real credit and asset to the community. So again, all that you and the staff at MAPC would recommend, we are very much willing to do to make this a great place for families to come together for, for happy events. Thank you. Uh, any questions for the applicant? Mr. Commissioner Warren? It sounds like you're ready to invest. Is that working? Okay, it sounds like you're really ready to invest a fairly significant amount of money to bring us up to speed. If you're denied, do you have a plan for making recovering that, that expense? How do you that is something that will be our second stage. We'll need to figure out exactly what we will do at that point. Um, this is something we've wanted to do for quite a while as a family. And that particular, the Quonset Hut, is, it's very neat. I mean, it can, it can be amazing, I think. And you had asked earlier about what was there in the past. And we have friends that's lived in the area for a long time. And they said that's where the orchards were. So I do think it was lots of orchards down there in that area. And then a water problem happened. And then they all kind of went away. All the trees died and such. Uh, Commissioner Blick? Um, just a question for a speaker. I see your site plan. It shows there's a con concrete slab that's in the back. Is that where the the building that was back there that caught on fire? Is that the concrete slab your account now? Yes, it is. And then the parking spaces. Now, are you putting, it shows 76 parking spaces. Are you going to put them on that slab or is that in between the Kwanzaa hut to the slab? It would also be on, on the slab. Um, we would have to make that area depending on the fire marshal, how many um, people occupancy we're allowed to have, but it would be on that slab and then it would have to be further a little bit towards the towards the house some too. So you're pretty much um, taking that 112 feet in that back side and then on the next slide over where it shows your proposed, you're gonna put 76 spaces and it's in conjoined, yeah, that one right there. That is pretty much 112 um, from north to south and then whatever it is with. Okay. 
Right. Yes. All right. That, that kind of answers okay. some questions. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Foster. Have you developed a business plan yet as far as how many people you expect to have at an event at a given time and how many cars you think would be there at a given time? Well, according to the what we went ahead and drew out here, it shows 76 spaces and four people per space is, is the way they allow you to do spaces. We don't really think we'll have that big of an occupancy, though, because we think that the inside, once the fire marshals come in, that they probably would allow maybe two to 250. We don't really know that yet, but we will accommodate whatever we're told. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Do you have plans for outdoor activities or everything would be contained within the building according to your current plan? If it is according to the current plan, it would really be inside mostly as far as wedding or anything such as that. They could come out a little bit on the front because there would be a little bit of space with the 100-foot setback. They would have a little bit of space there, so we would like to make that really pretty so they could possibly take pictures or something there. Okay, thank you. Any other questions so, from so the commission? There's no plans for outside music or entertainment at all? No, we aren't making a stage or anything like that. That would all be inside. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank um, you. Now we'd begin our public comment. So those of you who would like to speak on this case, please approach the podium, your name and address, and you have three minutes. And thank you again, all of you, for your patience sitting. You've learned so much about uh, the zoning process in Cedric County, haven't you? I'm sure you're just loving all that you've learned. Okay, go ahead. Oh, yeah, it's, it's been a learning, learning <laughs> event here. Uh, my name is James Smith. Uh, I live at 1510 East 79th Street. Uh, I actually have the property that joins directly to the east. Uh, my wife and I m bought this property in aspects of finding quiet, peace and quiet. Uh, we're close enough to things that we need to get to, shopping, uh, uh, gas stations, but we're far enough away from public congestion that, that helps us attain and keep that quiet that we've been looking for. I know myself, and, and I can speak for the surrounding neighbors that uh, we all share in an opposition to this type of a, of a venue. With this type of a venue, yeah, we've, we've already talked about the increased traffic, uh, not only in vehicles, but in people as well. Ha embedding this type of a venue right in the middle of our neighborhood is essentially increasing risk to both to both health and welfare of all surrounding properties. Uh, noise, we've talked about the noise. And, you know, honestly, I've been to weddings, I've been to reunions, I've been to these type of events. And those type of events aren't necessarily always contained within. How many times does that spill out to the outside? Being in such close proximity of this type of a venue, you know, what, what it's increasing the chances of alcohol related incidents. You know, it, who's to say somebody has a little bit too much to drink and decides to try to drive away from the one of these 76 parking spots and drives through an adjoined property. I think we've already heard an example of that from a previous speaker on a different case, but you know, th this chance is greatly increased. So therefore, it's putting us at a health risk. We've already talked about the noise, but as far as the traffic, you know, we're, we're, we're greatly concerned about not only just the vehicles, but also people. The other thing is, and I would ask you to ask yourselves, if you were in the market of looking for a house, what kind of interest would you put into a property that was right next door to a venue like this. Probably, I would, I would venture to say minimal. You know, if, if I found, really found a house that I really liked, but it was next door to a venue like this, 
I would say I don't even need to look at it. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. Questions for the speaker? If none, the ne next speaker. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Seth Roeder. I live at 1601 East 77th Street South. It's about five properties to the north of where this is at. Um, I actually appreciate you guys cleaning up. That's fantastic. I, I do appreciate that. Um, Sound-wise, as those complaints, for us, it's not that big of a deal. But as Commissioner Foster mentioned earlier, trees don't really create an actual buffer for sound. And in terms of the traffic, uh, 79th Street is a main road, but it's the main road into Derby from this area connecting Hayesville to Derby. Um, and currently, uh, 63rd Street being the other main road into Derby, the bridge is under construction. So uh, traffic is being rerouted through this southern route. So there is being more traffic currently uh, that would be recorded in terms of that. Um, other than that, just kind of reiterating the point, uh, it brings in the prospect of a little bit of crime, a little bit of alcohol, um, drunk drivers, more traffic. It's a great idea, but I just don't feel it's great for this area. It's completely just, it's neighborhoods all in this area. There's a sand pit slightly to the north, but uh, that's basically it. Um, and I don't have any more to comment. Any questions? Any questions? Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Next speaker. You need to supply uh, your mints. name and address, please. Well, you need to you need to supply mints. Oh, sorry. Okay. Okay. <laughs> My name is Dina Roeder. I live at 1601 East 77th Street South, and I have lived in the area for 45 years. We currently live at this address. We've lived there for 20 years. Before that was three blocks over on Patty. So we've, been, we've lived in the area a long time. It was the Mahoney's and the, um, who did she marry? Um, Hancock who owned all this area at that time. And the thing, uh, the Hancocks 30 years ago decided to put in a clay pigeon chute. So on the weekends, we had to endure all that popping and popping. Now it was only for a, t a time, but it was still on the weekends where we were home, we had worked, we were now home on the weekends. I see this as the same situation. They're putting in this venue that's going to be there for the weekend. And it's going to interrupt, and it's probably going to do, do well, so it's going to be every weekend. And I don't think that's fair to my neighbors. And that is why one of the reasons, because we live five properties to the north, one of the reasons that I'm here is to support those neighbors that are right next door. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Any questions for the speaker? Good. Next speaker. My name is Marcy Smith. I live at 1510 East 79th Street South with my husband. We bought this property because A, like he said, is perfect location in the country, but still close enough to things that we needed to get to work being one of those things. I get up at 4 a.m. I do not want an event 100 feet from my bedroom window until 10 o'clock at night. Um, we also do own the garage that's in the... I don't know if I'm doing this right. <laughs> that's in the... Um, they said it was zoned as light commercial, which we were unaware of that when we purchased the property. The previous owners were unaware of that as well. So we had no idea that that's how it was zoned. It will never be zoned 
while we're living there, as a, it will never be used, excuse me, as a commercial property. Um, it's our house. It's the first time we've ever had land. My husband is a combat vet, and he's retired military. We moved here to be closer to his family. We like this place because it is less than a mile from his parents. It's less than a mile from his sister. Um, and we, we love it. It's the first time we've ever had land. And I feel like my husband deserves to have a property that he can be proud of. And if we do ever decide to sell at some point, he's already spoken to our mortgage company and they said it will decrease our property value to have a commercial property right next door. We basically share a fence with them. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Any questions for the speaker? Question from Commissioner Warren. Yes, sir. Right. So you're opposed to any kind of commercial business in there, not just, not just a a venue, but anything that had a commercial taste to it. Correct. You. Commissioner Hicks. So Nix. So were you? You must have been opposed to what was there before. Sounds like it was not a very good deal. Right? Yes, we weren't happy with the neighbors that were there before. I used to work nights, and I would stay up all night before my next night shift, and I could hear them sawing and cutting up metal on two, three o'clock in the morning. Um, so. It was a nuisance. Um, we do have dogs, and they would bark at that, so it was very difficult to deal with that. Um, and when they left, we had no idea that this would even be a possibility that somebody would try to put a commercial property right in between houses. Okay, any other questions? Thank you for your testimony. Is there another speaker on this? Case? Uh, any speakers virtually? Are you going to? My name is Patricia Martin, and I live at fourteen oh one. East 78th Street, South Hayesville. My backyard butts up against this monster. <laughs> when the Sedgwick County Fire Department evicted the people that previously owned it and they put up a for sale sign, we said, oh good, somebody will come in there and raz that and build a nice house. We don't want a business in there. We're a quiet neighborhood. Thank you. Any questions for the speaker? Thank you for your testimony. Anyone virtually who'd like to speak on this case? If not, the uh, applicant, you can come back for two minutes of rebuttal to respond to the current concerns that have been expressed. I don't know if there's any specific questions or anything. Um, I feel like that the house before the previous owners, it was really, really bad. And like saying that they were doing things during the night, I would agree with that. It's really a bad situation to have neighbors like that. Way worse if they're not taking care of the property. And if you worry about things coming into your yard, animals and stuff because of all of the trash. Um, I don't know if there's any other thoughts or anything that anybody had questions on. Um, We've been over there working, and so we do hear things in the neighborhood. There's some kids that like dirt bike in the neighborhood, so it's not a super quiet neighborhood. And then with 79th Street traffic, but it's just it's just neighbors. And then you hear mu music, like when we were there Saturday, people playing their music, which is doesn't bother us at all. Um, our family grew up with dirt bikers, so <laughs> we don't mind that. But it's not just it's just typical neighborhood, I guess. So if there's anything thank else, you. <laughs> thank you. Any other questions? Then let's bring it back to discussion of the commissioners. Commissioner Warren. Gathering my thoughts here. In a perfect world, you would knock down the building, bulldoze it, haul everything off, and start with a new house. But we don't live in a perfect world. Uh, we've got a property that's been distressed for decades. Uh, and somebody's trying to do something to clean it up and, and do an improvement to the area. 
there's no gonna, there's no outside activities that are being planned as a part of this. Everything's going to be inside. Uh, I was I was really on the fence on this one. I was which way I was going to go, but I'm looking at this and saying that there's not a there's not an easy answer to it. And this is this is the best thing to come down the pike in a long long time. Um, so I'm going to move that we we approve with the conditions set forth by staff under the approval. We have a motion on the table. Do you have a second? Yeah, I'll second it for discussion. I was uh, kind of feeling the same way uh, coming into this. Uh, I didn't realize how much uh, the new owners are uh, planning on investing into this property. And, and I realized that uh, the site plan is all that is been, that has been presented to us and it's it's lacking in a lot I you know I can you know, identify that you know for example 76 parking spaces are not going to happen back there in the back but I mean that's that's beside the point um, I think that that uh, I I hardly endorse the the project that they've got planned and right okay we have a motion and a second discussion I so I'm not going to I'm, I'm not going to be able to support this because, number one, it's out in the county. It's less on less than five acres. If you've ever gone, you, we, there's no noise requirements out in the county. So if they get in there and the noise is loud and we have, I don't know what the closest distance is of the houses that are next to that, but I drive by this property all the time and I know that they're pretty close. We put these neighbors potentially in a position where if the noise is really loud, they can't do anything about it because there's no noise ordinance out in the county. And if you've ever lived in a house that you had a neighbor, even a couple of houses down that plays music really loud till all hours of the night, it really inhibits your ability to enjoy uh, your existing property. So for that reason, I won't be able to support uh, approving this. Thank you. Commissioner Foster. I do appreciate all the work that's being done to clean up this property, and I'm sure the neighbors do too, but that doesn't necessarily mean this is an appropriate place to have a commercial event center. I think it's not. Um, it's just simply surrounded by too much residential use. It's a residential zone. Um, if the applicant wanted an event center, I think they should have looked for a more appropriate location. Um, it's not the neighbor's fault that you're putting in a lot of work to clean up the property. Um, I, I will not be supporting this particular application. Uh, Commissioner Duell. I know this is not an ideal use of that property, but I think we need to consider <clears throat> if nothing's done to it, it's going to stay the way it is. And if you were one of the people that lived in that area, which would you rather have take a chance on somebody that says, that they, I, you know, you don't know what's going to happen with what, with what people tell you, but it sounds like it's going to be a better option and what's there now, so I'm going to support it. Commissioner Nix? I think I'd have to agree with Mr. Duell. Uh, I don't know exactly how long it's been in disrepair, and the people who had the property before obviously abused the thing. If if it just sits there and it's vacant, I mean, there's no guarantee that someone's going to come in and buy it and build a big house and... Uh, so I'm going, to, I'm going to support it. I'm going to take a, I would take a chance on the people just based on what we have heard today that we'll get in there and do a good job and try to keep the noise down and have a nice venue. So that's my opinion. Any other comments um, before we call yeah, the question? I, I have one. They, the comment about there's no way they can get 75 parking lots in the back, um, that seems to indicate that, that they may not be able to get as many people into their business as they planned. So that makes me wonder if it, if it has a chance of going. And, and there's no guarantee, like there's no guarantee that somebody will buy it and put a big house there. 
but there's no guarantee that somebody won't. And I have friends in Texas that bought a Quonset house and made a beautiful home out of it. So there, there are, there are other possibilities and, and I don't see that there's enough parking. If they need 250 people, uh, to, to be profitable on an event, where are they going to park? Uh, I guess all over the place. But um, I don't think I can support it either. I think there are other uses for this for this property, and I think the market's hot, and something else might be done to it. Other comments That's or all. discussion? I think I would then call the question. Let's do a roll call vote. Approve with staff conditions for the approval. So an I would be approving the vote, a nay uh, denying. Okay. Uh, roll call begins. Yes, ma'am. Fox? Nay. The small acreage is my greatest concern. There's just not enough distance between the neighbors in my estimation for an event center. Dual? Yep. Yes. John McKay is absent. Green? Aye. Aye. Bill, Bill Johnson? Yes. Blick? Nay. Nix? Yes. Foster? No. Warren. Yes. Joe Johnson. Nay. Miles. Nay. Hartman is absent. Cunningham. <coughs> Cunningham. I'm sorry, no. Williams Bay. <laughs> Ma'am, I have five voted in favor, seven against. Motion fails, seven, five. Do we want a, a positive motion to deny, or is that vote enough? Uh, I, to that question, I, Justin Wagoner, Deputy County Counsel, I would suggest having a, a motion that would carry. I would like to move that we deny the application for the event center in the county. Second. I have a motion from Commissioner Foster, second Commissioner Miles. Uh, roll call vote, please. Fox. This time an aye denies the request. Aye. Dual. No. McKay is absent. Green. No. Bill no. Johnson. No. Blick. Aye. Nix. No. Foster. Aye. Warren. No. Joe Johnson. Aye. Miles. Aye. Hartman is absent. Cunningham. Aye. Williams Bay. Aye. Motion passes seven five. Thank you for Ms. Your Fox, this is Joe Johnson. I need to leave the meeting. Okay. Note that Joe Johnson is now exiting the meeting. Our next case, 4.5. Um, CUP 2022-0041. Uh, Aaron, will you please come forward as staff to present this case? Good afternoon, Erin Ebach, friend again. CUP 22, uh, sorry, 2022, um, 0041 is a request to amend the Hanley Residential Community Unit Plan, CUP DP 154, to permit a car wash on parcel seven of the, the CUP. The subject site is zoned LC Limited Commercial, and it's located on the east side of North Webb Road and within one quarter mile of East 21st Street North. 
This parcel is just under one acre in size and is currently developed with a, um, a vacant commercial structure, I believe it was a bank um, previously. The proposed amended language would add a car wash to the list of permitted uses for the parcel subject to the supplementary use regulations um, and the development guidelines of the CUP. The CUP is um, 47 acres in size and has a total of seven parcels. These include um, a multifamily residential complex, an assisted living facility, and a church. Um, parcel seven is located in the northwest corner of the CUP. Um, it abuts the um, Hanley commercial community unit plan right to the north. Um, Paul, if we could actually go to the, the CUP diagram, that would be wonderful. Um, next diagram, sorry. And you have a copy of this in your staff report um, as well. It's a little difficult to see here, but um, you can see this is north. So we've got Northwood Road here, and then this is 21st Street. Um, this is parcel seven. The, the Hanley Commercial CUP is here abutting the property to the north, and then um, the residential CUP kind of wraps around the, the commercial CUP there to the north. Um, and. So with that, the commercial CUP is zoned LC Limited Commercial District. Um, it is developed with a service station, convenience stores, uh, a convenience store, I'm sorry, um, a multiple indoor dining, outdoor establishments with established patios um, and strip retail. To the south and east of the site, uh, of the subject site, the property is developed with the Regent Assisted Living Facility this property is zoned GO General Office District. And then um, the subject site abuts, again, North Web Road to the west and um, does face on the other side of Webb a financial institution. And then the Legacy Park Wilson Estates Edition is um, also abutting the site across North Web Road. The Unified Zoning Code requires a conditional use for a car wash when it is within 200 foot of residential zoning. The, um, when this request is on property with the CUP, um, the CUP amendment can act in lieu of that conditional use. Um, but this site, due to its proximity to the Legacy Park Wilson Estates properties on the, the other side of Webb, um, being approximately 150 foot away, if this use was permitted, um, or I'm sorry, with, without the CUP, it would still require the conditional use um, approval due to the proximity to residential zoning. The um, proposed CUP language provided by the contract pur purchaser um, has provided anticipated hours of operation which are 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Monday through Friday, 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. on Saturday, and 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. on Sunday. Um, if we could go to the, the site plan, Paul, please. So this is the, the proposed site plan from the applicant. And the proposed um, car wash egress is to the, um, the west, so you would enter the car wash at um, this point, exit there. And um, because of that, that indicates that blowers are going to be oriented toward the Northwest Street right of way. Webb Street, I'm sorry. Um, vacuum stalls are to be located south of the car wash structure um, to the west of the proposed entrance. And um, staffing numbers for the site will be determined by volume. Um, the, the subject property is in relatively close proximity to residential structures to the southeast and southwest of the site. At its closest point, the assisted living facility, the, the Regent, is approximately 140 foot from this subject site's east property line. And then to the southwest, um, the north most, northeast most dwelling in the Legacy Park Wilson Estates Edition is only 200, 
approximately 215 foot from this site's west property line. Um, should the requested amendment be approved, the surrounding properties um, may experience a substantial level of noise due to their proximity to the site. I do want to note that that applies both to those residential properties, but also um, to, uh, to the commercial properties to the north, specifically um, some of the restaurants that heavily rely on outdoor patios as a portion of their business. Um, the staff report as printed stated that the proposed architectural elevations did not um, meet the standards of the architectural controls for parcel seven in the CUP DP 154. I have since spoken with the applicant um, or their agent, I should say, and they are prepared to, rather than request an amendment to the architectural controls, which would be required um, if they were to go forward with the plans as submitted, they are going to revise the um, provided elevations to meet the requirements of the the CUP, specifically um, those re in regard to um, the roof pitches, um, the facade being um, brick and siding and of colors you know, more similar to properties in the CUP to the north, as well as the residential, um, the Regent Assisted Living Facility to the um, southeast. So I did want to update they are willing to do that um, should this be approved. And then as indicated by the proposed site plan, six off-street parking stalls, um, including one handicapped stall, are to be provided um, in this area here. And um, 15 queuing spaces located between the entrance and the order box, um, which it is a car wash, but the, the verbiage is still order box. Um, that what is shown on the site plan does meet their QE requirements um, in regard to what is required by the, um, the zoning code. Staff finds that the requested amendment does not conform to the community investments plan um, as the intensity of the use and the associated impacts of the proposed car wash are not seen to be um, what is recommended, not seen to be um, suitable for what is recommended by the plan for the subject area. Um, the locational I'm sorry, the abutting properties in the CUP are comprised of lower intensity commercial and residential uses, while a car wash is typically considered a higher intensity use. Um, and in this instance, there would not be buffering land between the car wash and the Regent property to the southeast um, of the site. In addition, uh, the exit with the dryers here would point toward the west um, and those residences located in the Wilson Estates villas um, are located approximately 140 to 250, I'm sorry, in general residences are located 140 to 250 feet away. Um, therefore, the approval of this request would be inconsistent with specifically locational guidelines provided by the plan. Um, and then Lastly, design guidelines suggest that non-residential uses should provide appropriate screening and buffering from residential uses when necessary. Um, and these uses should have site design features that limit traffic, noise, lighting, and adverse impacts on surrounding residential land uses. There is currently a masonry wall that runs um, along the site's west property line, separating it from, um, I'm sorry, the east property line, separating it from the, the Regent property um, to the east. Um, however, additional site design features may be necessary to limit all of the potential negative um, or adverse impacts of the proposed use. And, and based on those impacts to the surrounding properties and the nonconformance to um, the comprehensive plan, staff is recommending denial of this request. Um, and if we could. I'll go to the site photos if we could move to um, pictures here. So this is the uh, pre-existing bank building that is currently vacant. Next photo, please. This is the, the Regent facility, which you can see does um, fit that kind of residential character with the, the multiple pitches of the roof and the siding and brick facade. Next photo, please. 
Um, this is directly south. Um, there's another kind of office type of building there and then that private drive. Next photo, please. This is directly across from the subject site, um, across North Webb. So you can see there's Sunflower Bank. And then um, you can't see in this photo, but just, you know, over, uh, let's see, southwest of there was where the Wilson Estates um, subdivision is located. Next photo, please. And then here you can see, so I'm standing kind of when I'm taking this photo right kind of at the, the center of the site or parallel of the door, but you can see that the Dino's restaurant patio here um, to the northeast, and then um, the uh, Greystone or, or Jack's patio um, up here to the north. Next photo, please. And then with that, I am happy to stand for questions. Questions for Aaron. Seeing none, we will move to public comment. I'm sorry, what did I miss? Applicant or agent, yes, you get to speak to. Applicant or agent, please, you come forward. Pardon me? It's been a long day. I even have two checklists. Is the applicant or agent yes, uh, still with us online? Yes, uh, this is Andre Sutiano with GM Super Engineering in Allen, Texas. Uh, the applicant, uh, take five, uh, Carl was just informed me to request to table this case for yeah. until the next meeting. Sounds like they want to defer the case until the, the next, next meeting. MAPC meeting. We have members of the public here who've been waiting patiently. I'm going to look to I, legal on this one. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's right there. You get 10 lawyers, you get 11 opinions, right? So that's going to be the case. Um, I am, we've already heard this, and unless they've got a justification for deferral, we've got a lot of people, like you said, that's been sitting here. I don't like allowing the public to speak and then coming back after the fact and doing it and, and keeping the meeting open. So unless it, I would state that one of the options you have is one, allow the deferral, or two, make sure they have some kind of specific reason for not wanting to go forward. Can you state for us a specific reason that you, we can't proceed at this time? Again, we have members of the public who are, have been waiting all day to give testimony. I understand. Um, he was waiting uh, for the meeting also, but then he has to jump off to another meeting. And then he asked me to ask the pending commission if we can table the case. He, he had to go to another meeting. Are you able to speak on the applicant's behalf? Not really, because there are some uh, issues that he can explain much better than I do. Uh, I need help with history on this. I can we go forward with testimony and provide a complete, or Mr. John, or Commissioner Johnson, Commissioner Johnson needs a microphone that works. Uh, I guess if they're going to defer it, maybe it never comes in front of us, so they're not going to get it approved. So. Uh, in that respect, I'd be in favor for a deferral, and if I was want to speak against it, I want to see what they come up with before I make any comments, because I wouldn't want comments made in here, and they got a chance to go back and try to overcome those. But that's my personal opinion. Was that a motion to defer? <laughs> Uh, I'll start with additional, some discussion first. We have additional legal comments, or uh, Commissioner Duell. I just had a question. Uh, as Microphone, please. Oh, excuse me. I had a question as to uh, the applicant. It shows Equity Bank, and then it shows Take Five Car Wash. 
Why is the bank part of the applicant? Is that the bank that was there? Uh, and what do we know about Take 5 Car Wash? Anything? I believe that the Equity Bank owns the site, um, and Take 5 Car Wash is the contract purchaser of the site, should this be approved. But Equity Bank is actually the owner um, currently for the property. Okay. Madam uh, Chairman, legal. Um, the gentleman on the phone is shown as an applicant on the application itself. And um, if it's the will of the board to defer it, it would, you know, I do not like deferral indefinitely because I just don't think that is fair to anybody. But it would require a vote to suspend the bylaws to allow for that to occur and then to vote for the deferral itself. But, um, you know, he is shown as the applicant, okay. and we don't have any rules that say just because the right person's not there because they had some, you know, we don't have anything that says that in the rules. So again, I'm kind of saying that the, if, if we were to hold a vote, let's say we decided to deny it, what would their, what would their um, recourse be? Because we have people who took days off work and, and are here, and they're not saying, uh, oops, I got another meeting to go to. They're, they're hanging in there. Philip, can you respond to that question? Yes, ma'am. Philip Zevenbergen with planning staff. Um, if the planning commission were to recommend denial, this will be going to the district advisory board too next Wednesday. Um, because it's a CUP amendment, um, it wouldn't necessarily have to go to city council, but if you recommend denial and the district advisory board recommends denial, then it does not go to city council. It's done. If this board recommends denial and the district advisory board recommends approval or the um, alternative is this board recommends approval and there's protest petitions submitted, it would go to city council for final decision. So there's an opportunity that it could be, if this board recommends denial and the district advisory board recommends denial, the application would be done at the um, end of the district advisory board two meeting, unless the applicant submits a appeal of the planning commission decision to appeal it to city council. Kind of a staff question. I think we've done this before. We can hear it, and at that point, we would have three choices: one to approve, one to disapprove. But we would have the opportunity to defer at that point if we got information or testimony that we wanted to. We wanted to defer. Could we defer at that point, or we have to? Do we have to make a yay or nay decision? Well. Sorry, one one point I would bring up, and I'm so sorry it doesn't. I don't know that it addresses that question, Mr. Warren. But the the issue is is that you've you've had a staff report on this item, and now the applicant is saying they want to defer it. And I just the question is, what about the precedent that that sets for other applications if they don't like the staff presentation and they've and and we've had no notice to defer it. So. We've had a case on the agenda that has said deferred so that people who showed up knew that they shouldn't waste their time sitting and waiting to speak. And so I just look at it from a precedent standpoint. I'll defer to legal, though. Yeah, again, I'm sorry I can't put my finger on it, but I think there's an, something in the code that talks about the ability of the applicant to defer prior to the matter. If they have the right to defer any time throughout the course, what Scott was saying is true. Uh, the applicant is here. The stated applicant on the application is present to speak. Uh, yeah, it's been a long day, but they, everybody knew this was going to be a long day, and you know it's kind of one of those things that's kind of unfortunate. The circumstances are if you proceed forward, then um, you, the applicant would have their opportunity for whatever whatever they could say, say what they needed to, and then hear the public comment. Then at that point, you'd uh, uh, you'd have the options available to you. If you defer, 
not be not now but after all the public comments are made you're going to have to have a record established as to who spoke and what was said so if you and keep the public hearing open to go back and redo it then you've got to police like well last time you spoke and you spoke about this you can't speak again you've already had your three minutes and then the opponents have a very difficult time trying to come back and say, well, you know, we had all these people here before, they're not here again. These guys had the opportunity to hear all the public arguments, come back within their 10 minutes, and have kind of a uh, woodshedded approach to the hearing. I'm in favor of moving forward. That's just my two cents. I am too. So we are going to proceed with this case. Um, we don't. Do we need a motion to deny the request to delay? It, the it does say it's discretionary, so I would make a motion to say that the request has been made to defer, and then you do whatever you wish from that point. I, I would deny. I would make a motion to deny the request to defer at this point. Second. Second. We have a substitute motion to de deny the request to. So we have a motion to deny deferral and a second. All in favor of the motion to deny deferral? I'm going to make a substitute motion. Aye. Okay. Aye. We a substitute motion. Go ahead, Commissioner Johnson. I want to make a motion to defer it so that uh, I, I feel sorry for the people who are here, but I still think I don't know if they're going to bring anything back, so nothing will be built there. Don't have to worry about it. I'll second. I'm sorry. Is that a motion to defer indefinitely or to a certain date? Two weeks. <clears throat> We have a motion to defer for two weeks. The second is agreeable. Uh, second, Commissioner Green is agree agreeable to this change. We need a roll call vote. Yes. Yes, ma'am. So this is on the substitute motion to defer the item for two weeks to the next MAPC meeting. Fox? Aye. Can we clarify the motion is to defer? Right. So voting I defers. Correct. Voting nay does not defer. Correct. Okay. So Fox? I. Duel. No. McKay is absent. Green. I. Bill Johnson. I. Blick. Nay. Nix. Nay. Foster. No. Warren. No. Joe Johnson. Absent. Miles. Nay. Hartman is absent. Cunningham. Nay. Williams Bay. Nay. I have that the motion fails three to eight. Motion fails. We'll proceed with this case. Applicant. Uh, <laughs> now we vote yeah, on the original the motion. motion. The, the lawyer team is conferring. Now there's a motion on the floor. You voted on the substitute, so you need to go back to the original. Okay. The original yes. motion. Didn't. Denied, denied the, request the request for deferral. For deferral. So, no, I think we, we actually, our call. bylaws have to do it on a split vote. We have to do a okay. roll call. All right. So this is it on, on the motion to deny the request for the deferral. Fox? Nay. Duel? Yes. McKay is absent. Green? 
Nay. Bill Johnson? Nay. Blick? Aye. Nix? Yes. Foster? Aye. Warren? Aye. Joe Johnson? He's gone. <laughs> Miles? Aye. Hartman is absent. Cunningham? Aye. Williams Bay? Motion passes. Motion passes. passes seven to three. Eight to three. We'll proceed with this case applicant. Uh, as named on the application, you have 10 minutes to present. Please state your name and address. Yes, my name is Andre Sutiano with GM Super Engineering. Um, we are the super engineers uh, for this project for a car wash, a self surface car wash where the customers uh, have the car wash and then they can have the option to either uh, do their own vacuuming or they can leave. And yeah, I'm here to answer any questions. Questions for the applicant? Mr. Commissioner Warren. Now, do you have any other operations similar to this in this area? Yes, uh, we have actually another project in, on Seneca. Is that already operational? No, it's, on, uh, it's in the review with the city. Do you have plans for uh, additional projects in the, in the Wichita area? I, I do not know. Thank you. Any other questions for the applicant? Seeing none or hearing none, you please do remain with us. After the public testimony, you'll have an opportunity for a rebuttal. Uh, so I would now call for public comment on this case. Uh, those of you who've patiently waited, please come forward. I'm sorry we don't have mints. <laughs> My name is Kathy Erickson, and I represent Fred Hanley, the original developer of this area. I had a slide that I sent in. Oh, I'm sorry, 1033 North Woodrow. I had a slide that had the whole CUP outline. It's in your packet. Can you stay at the microphone too, please, so those Sorry. online can hear you? Thank you. Sorry. Well, I can tell you that Fred is really sorry that he can't be here. He did record a short video that hopefully you all were able to see and watch. He developed this CUP originally in 1986, and at that time, he worked with Marvin Kraut, a name from the past that a lot of you will remember. He and Marvin came up with the CUP language. Specifically for Parcel 7, it restricts general automotive use. I don't see how anyone looking at a car wash can say that it's not automotive. We're not washing you know, clothes, we're not, we're not doing other things. It is a car wash by its name is automotive use. So we stand by that. It hasn't changed the integrity and the character of the entire CUP has not changed in all the years. Sorry that we have been doing this. The site here this bank site, it was Rose Hill Bank. Then it changed to American State Bank. American State Bank was bought out by Equity Bank. That's how Equity Bank came to own the property. I have been told that they have deed restricted this property and it cannot be another bank site, which I understand because they're just a half a mile 
down the road on, on Webb Road. I will tell you that we met with some of the homeowners that live in the clubhouse villas at Wilson Estates, which is referenced in your report. I believe you received a copy of the, the protest petition that, um, you know, uh, roughly 28 homeowners signed. And you also should have received letters, thank you, from some of the tenants at Cambridge Market. I just want to tell you one thing real quick, and I'm going to run out of time. So where I'm standing now, about to those windows, is the distance from the Dino's patio to the entrance to the car wash. So Dino's is going to basically lose about 40 seats on their patio. That's how much they have. And unless you're going to serve burgers with a side of car wash, you're going to be out of luck. Thank you for your testimony. Any questions for the speaker? <laughs> Commissioner Warren. Do you need two more minutes? Are well, I done? can talk for two more minutes, but I think I'm going to have a dry mouth thing. Okay. Thank you for your testimony. Yeah. Uh, is there another speaker on this yes. topic? Paul, could you please pull up the um, CUP drawing, and you could use the mouse. He's going to pull up the drawing of the whole CUP. Okay. Um, back one, please. No, go forward one. Oh, so this is the whole CUP. Yeah, the other forward, one is just the side. Okay. My apologies. Go forward one. Okay. That's the site plan. That works. That works. It's consistent with that. Uh, my name is Tim Buchanan. I live at uh, my residence is at 1875 North 159th Street in Wichita. I am the owner of the Regent, which is uh, this this applicant's property is in my front yard at the Regent. I would ask for a little bit of, uh, of time because I am here to represent myself. I've also been asked by the residents of the Regent, uh, whom you've had letters from and a petition from, uh, they've asked me to represent them. That was kind of at my request, so they didn't all come down and occupy the room uh, for the meeting. So I would ask for a bit of a leeway. And I would, I would take some time just to make a clarification. The Regent is an independent living community with independent living residents. It's not an assisted living licensed residence. The people that live at the Regent are quite independent. They work outside the community. They have cars. They have garages at the Regent. So it's really, really important to understand who lives there at the Regent. We did use, uh, I think this is another correction, we did use the residential zoning that is allowed for in the CUP for our parcel. It was uh, allowable for office use and residential use, and it's not being used subject to a conditional use. Uh, being the owner of 115 units of independent living, uh, the applicant's property is <clears throat> essentially in our front yard. And we purchased our property relying on the CUP prohibition of automotive uses. And I'll echo the, <clears throat> the uh, reality that a car wash is none other than an automotive use. It's specifically prohibited on this particular parcel in the CUP. And it would require a major amendment of the CUP to allow the car wash. And the applicant seeks to amend it, I think, expressly for this reason. <clears throat> the significant increase in the noise levels from the machinery, the automobiles, the vacuums, the car radios from morning until evening till later in the evening on the weekends uh, is a significant disruption to the character of the neighborhood and a significant disruption to the people who you received a petition from that live in my building that enjoy the quietness of the evening, they enjoy watching the sunset over the west, without the disruption of car radios and the lights from a car wash. Uh, my marketing team has already encountered prospects who have asked about the car wash sign that's out front and are hesitating in their decision to choose the region for their living options until they, quote, know the outcome of the car wash. 
Because residents living at the region many years, uh, five to 10 to 12 years, each lost sale to me represents a lost revenue of about 300 to $500,000, causing a significant harm to my business. <clears throat> the, uh, I will point out, is that the end of my three minutes? Yep, 15 seconds. I will, then I will point out, if that's all the time I'm gonna have, I will point out that the applicant has not demonstrated that they can actually use this parcel for a car wash. If you see these three approaches, and if you point out, the, there's a line right here in the pavement, if you look on this aerial, the applicant's approach and entry is actually in the parking lot of the region and is on my private property. It is not in a street right of way. The street, and you'll see it on the aerial uh, that was passed around, the street is in a dedicated street right of way. It's a city street up to a point about here where that uh, storm inlet is. And in fact, the storm inlet is actually on my private property. It's not in the city right of way. And that storm inlet drains into a pond system to the south that is in an association of which the applicant is not a party. And I have some general concerns regarding the water clarity of the, of the water coming off the car wash that's gonna go flow into those ponds. While your so, original time is up, I would grant you an additional two minutes, seeing that you're representing 151 clients uh, that, and that you encourage not to come. Which, for which we're grateful. Uh, thank you. I'll try and I'll, I'll appreciate that. And thank you guys for your endurance here today. It's, it's, uh, I, I appreciate it. <clears throat> um, the region residents drive and they use their cars to access nearby dining and retail. The turn lane that they have to use to get into our property is a, a nickname suicide lane. It's a center turn lane in Webb Road. And to use that center turn lane in the proximity to 21st Street is by no means an easy feat. And the additional traffic required by the car wash to get into this to get into this street, which basically is a residential street, is going to create, I think, a really unnecessary level of harm and danger to everybody turning that corner, including the car wash uh, users that would come into that. The current planning regulations and staff guidance for new CUPs calls for cross flow access between commercial uses in order to pre, in order to, to eliminate the need for people to go out on the arterial just to reach a nearby business. This applicant has, has actually cut off the two cross flow accesses on the north side of their property, eliminating the ability for my customers and my residents to go even to walk from where they live and or to drive their car and to patronize the businesses there, the, the restaurants and the dining. The adjoining uses are all primarily retail. You saw the characteristics of the architecture. They all share pitched, roof, pitched roofs, subdued lighting, and they all share a, a pretty general nice look. And we're not objecting to the architectural design of the building. It's everything else about the car wash, significantly the most of which it's a uh, prohibited use. So in denying the, the, the uh, application would not present a hardship on the applicant. There's a lot of thriving business development going on in this corridor. It is a perfect location for another bank. There's a bank right across the street. Uh, that's what this building was built for, but the applicant has specifically restricted the use of this site without a bank. So there are other uses, so there's no hardship placed on the applicant for, for your denial of this application. Thank you again for your time. Thank you. Any questions for the speaker? We appreciate your testimony. Any other speakers on this case? My name is Clifford Neese. I live at 15565 Southwest Butler Road, south of Rose Hill, north of Rose Hill, two miles. I own the, the uh, office park called Cambridge Office Park, which has never been shown or anything on here, and I'm probably the one that's most affected. My property goes on the east side of, of uh, Webb Road from the car wash site clear down to the Edminster Bank uh, Church. So I have all that frontage on the east side. I have a, a office park. There's three buildings there. I didn't see any of, any of that on the pictures that you that you had here. <clears throat> so the office park, um, the property to the south is currently heavy traffic in and out. Our our park has. Um, uh, 
Cambridge Family Dentistry. We have six dentists in there, and they uh, require a lot of in and out um, access on the web road. It's very dangerous now, but if you have all that extra traffic from a car wash, you can probably run a car through a car wash, what, two minutes? So I don't know how many that is in a, in a, in a day or an hour, but it's going to terrifically increase that. But I think the bank is a is a very distinctive building, a very nice building, and I think the, uh, the car wash would affect my tenants, and they're all opposed to that. Thank you. Any questions for the speaker? Thank you. Thank you for a testimony. Other speakers on this case? My name is Patrick Hughes. I'm with the Adams Jones Law Firm. Address is 1635 North Waterfront Parkway. I'm here on behalf of the uh, quarters at Cambridge, which is in the CUP and has the apartment complex there, as well as the Cambridge Market, which is then to the north in the, the other CUP. And basically, there are two things that I want to bring to I, I want to bring to your attention. One is the traffic problem. There's already some some significant traffic along Webb Road there as you're going north toward 21st Street. And this, uh, there, this is really too close to have a light at this, this intersection where they're wanting to go in. And the problem that we're going to have is both people coming south in, that south in that turn lane, in the left turn lane, backing up toward Webb Road, and people, the additional traffic also getting coming through there because this obviously is a use that depends on traffic. Its nature is to generate traffic. So it's going to cause some difficulties at the intersection, including people going out from the, the Cambridge Center that currently, when they're trying to get there, you already have difficulties with traffic and it's going to cause that to be worse. The other thing I wanted to talk about is from the quarters at Cambridge's perspective, which is the apartment complex that's in the same CUP. This CUP was developed in accordance with the rules that are set out in it. And it's one thing to change the rules in a CUP when things have changed, because there's a change in circumstances. But here, everything, everyone has relied on the restrictions that are in the CUP to develop the area as it was developed. And there isn't anything that's changed. There's nothing that causes this particular parcel to not be able to be developed under its existing regulations that everybody else has relied on. And so I'd ask you to maintain the integrity of the CUP that has been developed in accordance with the, what the original designers had intended. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for the speaker? Other speakers? Okay, go ahead. I don't have any questions, but I have to. I have to jump off. That's Cindy. Okay. Yes. We, do we still have a quorum? We do. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Cindy. All right. Are there any virtual attendees who would like to speak on this item? Hearing none, uh, uh, applicant, can you? Uh, do you have any comments in response to the testimony you've heard? You have two minutes. Yes, uh, regarding traffic, I mean, we can do a traffic study and uh, present it to you and whatever the report uh, come out is. And regarding the noise, we, are, we can have blowers that is using, uh, has less noise for the blowers and then we can put an enclosure with a roof for the uh, vacuum enclosure. I mean, we can do all that stuff to help minimize the noise and uh, as of um, and also the architecture of the building are there questions for the applicant can you put an enclosure at the exit where there's a noise from the dryers is that a possible consideration so what the what the client told me and then also the architect they can put dampers to minimize the noise. And also I want to add uh, regarding the, the drainage. We usually 
uh, have a filtration system where we uh, for all the drainage before we put the storm water into the city's storm we usually filter the water before it goes into the storm okay thank you uh, bring it back to the board for discussion um, am I to understand that they they're not supposed to be within 200 feet of residential and that and that the region it, the region the regency is is a is a hundred percent residential and conformed to the residential zoning that was there so this is like really close i've been there many times it's uh it's really nice and i i don't i i do believe that people will not want to live there um, with a car wash in the front yard so i i do think it's going to cost the region some some money Commissioner Warren? I've been around a lot of these car washes, and to tell you the truth, the noise factor isn't a, isn't a big one to me because they're not as noisy <laughs> as a lot of people seem to, to fear. However, um, and I don't, I don't, I think from the residential standpoint, the properties that are over there, this would not be a major issue from a noise standpoint. But having two outside dining areas on the doorstep, that's that's a lot of noise for an outside venue right next door. So that's going to be enough. That's going to be enough of a factor for me to, to, uh, vote against, vote against, uh, approval of this project. Commissioner Williams Bay. I just wonder how many more car wash do we need in this town? <laughs> There's a car wash within probably three miles in either direction of the one that they're proposing right now. Two miles. I'm sorry. Two miles. It's all that walkability. Just, I, I, I just, I can't support this. Yeah, I can't uh, Commissioner Duell. Actually, there is a car wash about a block away from this on the uh, quick trip. Yeah, it's just one car car wash, but. Can we get some clarification on the entryway, on the private property that the owner of the region was talking about? You know, the, the access uh, in and out. Commissioner uh, Foster may have some I, I will try insight. to describe this. If you look at the, the drawing on the front page of the staff report and below the subject property where it says private drive, on the east end of the subject property on the south boundary, there's a little portion of the regent parcel. And that's exactly the portion that the applicant is describing as having three lanes of, of queuing going into the facility. Right. So they would have to redesign their site plan for starters because they're, as the, the uh, person who testified said, they're currently showing all the traffic for the car wash coming right through the private property of the regent. Does that clarify it for you? Yes. Okay. I would entertain a motion if we're ready, or Commissioner Warren, do you have a comment? Move to deny the amendment to the CUP. Second. We have a motion from Commissioner Warren, a second from Commissioner Foster. I would call uh, any further discussion on the motion. Then I would call for a roll call vote. Yes, this is a vote to deny, so an aye denies the applicant. Fox? Aye. Duel. McKay is absent. Green? Aye. Bill Johnson? Aye. Blick? Aye. Nix? Aye. Foster? Aye. Warren? Aye. Joe Johnson is absent. Miles is absent. Hartman is absent. Cunningham? Aye. Williams Bay? Aye. Motion passes to, to deny passes unanimously. Thank you. 10-0? 10-0.
Thank you. <laughs> oh, come on, Becky. Tough it out. Um, proceeding. Um, yes. Okay. Um, if we could take a seven-minute break, what time is it? Let's make it easy. It's 5.33. Seven minutes would put us at 5.40. Paul, um, do you want to put up a seven-minute timer on the screen? Yes. And uh, stand up, move in a circle, clean your ears or whatever else needs cleaning. And then uh, we're going to verify, are there persons online who are waiting to testify on a case? The cases we still have listed as to hear. Yes. Uh, can you tell me, sir, what case you're hoping to hear or to uh, speak on? Well, the one that... Uh off of Rock Road. I uh, think it's four zero one three. Two zero zero two triple zero forty nine Rock Road and East Thirty Ninth Street South. That's it. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay, hang in there with us. We're taking a seven minute break and then we'll be going back to our agenda. So we note that you're still present to participate. And is the agent or applicant for case zoning case 2022 0049 still with us? Is that you, Phil? Okay. And the thank you. Is there one anyone else virtual who's still waiting to hear yes. a case? Triple zero fifty. Okay. And is the um, applicant or agent for zoning case 2022 0050 still with us? Okay, bear with us. We're going to make sure that the applicant or the agent is also with us, and we'll be hearing that case shortly after our seven minute break. It's amazing how being in this seat puts your head to mush. <laughs> it does, doesn't it? Even with my checklist, like.
Our timer is up. We should move right along. Thank you, everybody, for returning promptly. And we are going to proceed with the next case on our agenda, which is uh, 4.12. Am I on target? No, 4.7, CUP 2244. Oh gosh, oh I was being optimistic right there. 4.7, Community Plan 2022, 0044. Philip, yes. take it away. Uh, this one was requested to be heard by Planning Commission. I'm going to do a very brief overview. There's a lot of moving parts with the CUP. There's a lot of changing details within the scope of what the original CUP um, was developed with. And so they're really just doing a lot of minor changes in a lot of different areas. And instead of going line item through what all those are, let me just do a brief overview and maybe um, wait for the question from the Planning Commission um, and address it that way. This is the Cross Point Community Unit Plan DP279. It's on the southeast corner of 21st and Greenwich, and it spans all the way over to K96. As you can see on the screen, it is limited commercial zoning. Um, they did a recent replat of this property, and they're aligning various things with the replat in addition to uh, changing some of the provisions and development standards in relation to that replat. But as I mentioned before, much of what they're um, requesting in terms of the changes of the development standards are within the realm of what was originally approved within the CUP. Um, I think one thing I'll specifically note is they are asking for additional signage on uh, both street frontages of 21st and Greenwich. However, if you look on page three, there's a table that shows that are, they are within the bounds of what's permitted within the sign code. So even though they're asking for additional signage, they're not asking for anything outside of what the property could have by just sheer um, permission from the sign code, so they're not asking for anything extra. Um, there are a couple, one clarification, uh, one of the case descriptions uh, mentions that they're removing land from the CUP. That's not entirely um, accurate. The little cutouts here are just currently developed parcels within the CUP that these changes do not apply to. So the CUP is this entire boundary and these cutouts are parcels that are currently developed and they were just not part of the amendment because nothing on their parcels are changing. So land is not being removed. There's just part portions of the CUP that are not involved because they're already developed and didn't need to have any changes. The majority of the CUP is undeveloped. It is mostly field. And so I, the request to amend the CUP is changing a long-standing CUP to make it more current market ready for future development at this location. Um, I think with that, I will stand. We haven't heard any public opposition to this. Um, it goes to DAB next week. Um, with that, I will stand for any questions that are specific um, to the staff report from the Planning Commission. Questions for Philip from the Commission. Were your questions answered by the report, everybody? Can we call forward the applicant for any additional comments? And again, thank you for hanging with us. I'm used to saying good afternoon, but good evening, <laughs> Commission, <laughs> Commissioners. Uh, Rebecca Melius, agent for the applicant, PEC 303 South Topeka here in Wichita. Um, we're, we've been working closely with staff on these changes. We're in agreement with their comment, but I'm happy to answer any specific questions that the Commission has that they wanted to hear. Thank you. Is it true we're getting a crumble cookie right in there? Or can you not say that yet? <laughs> Okay, never mind. <laughs> I am not a part of any negotiations for any letters of intent for development to happen in this CUP, so I cannot speak to that behalf. All right. Any other questions for the applicant? It's a, yeah, it's too many calories. You don't want to really know about it. Um, Plus, we need one on the west side first. Come on. Is there anyone present who would like to speak on this item? Anyone virtual who would like to speak on this item? If not, then I would uh, bring the discussion back to the commission. What's your pleasure? Move that we approve. 
We have a motion to approve from Commissioner Green. Second. Second from the rest of the commission. Uh, any discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion passes 10 0. Next, uh, 4 10. Zoning case 2022 0046 and conditional use 2022 0035. Do we want to make sure the applicant agent is still online? Are the applicant, is the applicant still online for this case? Yes, this is Camille Legali. Yes, I'm still online. Okay, thank you very much applicant. for hanging with us. Uh, staff, Erin, will you please begin your staff report? Yes, Erin Ebach, friend, the planning department. Um, these two cases are um, a re request for zone change from MF 39 multifamily residential to LC limited commercial district on um, one third of one third portion of the subject site. You can see there on the map um, to make this all then limited commercial zoning and then a conditional use to permit vehicle sales, um, vehicle and equipment sales, I'm sorry, outdoor on the entirety of the site. The property is um, approximately half an acre and generally located on the east side of North Hillside Avenue and with one block north of East 13th Street North. Um, the limited commercial district permits vehicle sales as a conditional use subject to the supplementary use regulations and um, again the, the rezone request is to permit the full use of the site for that vehicle sales. Um, the site is located in the northeast corner of North Hillside Avenue and East 13th Street North at that intersection, um, and it has frontage and access from North Hillside. The intersection and the surrounding neighborhood, as well as the, sub as well as the subject site, are located within the um, established central area and the central northeast area plan. Um, you can see here properties abutting the subject site to the north are zoned MF, 29 multifamily residential and are developed with a two family residence uh, or multifamily residences. Properties to the south of the subject site are zoned LC Limited Commercial District um, and this is an, used as an automotive shop. Properties to the east of the subject site are zoned TF3 two family residential and MF29 multifamily residential and are developed with single family residences and duplexes. And then west of the site across North Hillside Avenue, the properties are zoned LC Limited Commercial. Um, and they are undeveloped with the exception of there's a retail store and a parking lot. Um, the applicant site plan proposes that there will be 18 display sales for vehicles located on the northwest corner of the lot um, along North Hillside Avenue. Um, Paul, if we could go to the site plan. There, thank you. Um, while staff is recommending denial um, for this case, should the MAPC adopt alternative findings for approval, um, staff is recommending that the number of vehicles for sale be limited to five on this site. And then additionally, seven customer parking stalls would be required per the off-street parking schedule. Um, when doing a brief survey of the subject area, there are two other used car lots operating within a mile of the site. And the request uh, conditional use is found not to be in conformance with the community investments plan um, due to the community investment plan, the places for people plan, and as well as the north central north area plan as the intensity and scale of this use um, are not recommended by any of the three plans for this subject area. Um, I do want to note that DAB recommended denial of the request on 10-3, um, so on Monday. And with that, I'd be happy to stand, or sorry, I guess I'll go through site photos. Going too quick here. This is the, um, the, the LC portion of the subject site you can see, and then the undeveloped area there to the north. Next photo, please. See the north portion of the site. Next photo, please. And again, you can see the duplexes and multi or multifamily to the north there. Next photo, please. 
This is facing the intersection south of the site, the vehicle repair um, automotive service shop. Next photo, please. And then there's some neighborhood um, kind of retail strip here. Next photo, please. And then west of the site, where you can see it's, it's undeveloped on this area, um, with the exception of um, this convenience liquor store, and then um, parking lot. That, I'm happy to answer any questions. Questions for staff? Question. Go ahead. Emily, did they, uh, when Deb denied this, did they know there would be five cars or less? Yes. Could so, be five cars or less? Yeah. Uh, yes, I, I presented the item at the DAB meeting, and they discussed the various numbers. They did, they, and they went back and forth. It was a, it was a quite a bit of discussion among them for it. Um, also, should note that the applicant was not present during the DAB meeting. Okay. Any other questions from the commission for staff? If not, then applicant, we'd like you to speak. Please, you have up to 10 minutes. Please start by giving us your name and address. Hi, uh, my name is Camille Ligali. Um, I, I live on 2510 East Barney Street, in which apartment 502 in Wichita, Kansas, 67211. So uh, I will, uh, first would like to uh, uh, present my sincere apology to the DAB Commission people. I actually plan to attend that meeting. Uh, I was provided with uh, a URL in order for me to uh, attend virtually but it just happened that yeah, I was given the wrong one. I, nobody told me that I was supposed to contact, you know, the DAB uh, commission people, which was supposed to be a separate department in order for me to get that correct uh, meeting. So I was online on this specific URL that I'm, yeah, I'm using right now. So uh, I'm very, very sorry for that. So uh, the application, my application for condition, uh, for rezoning and condition I use, is to is the condition are you for a small portion or you guys already know for uh, a car business uh, you know uh the staff report uh mentioned that uh there's gonna be equipment sale i'm not planning to sell any equipment or anything like that it is just strictly a uh, car with a simple workflow purchase the vehicle you know give them a test drive you know uh, if there's anything that needs to be fixed send them to my mechanic fix them get them detailed and then you know display them for sale so you guys can also see you know according to uh my site plan i did not plan to kind of like turn that place to like a 80s toyota or rex cf4 with like a lot of vehicle i i, I have just a simple business plan with like a, a starter so uh what i just did is just like be able to sell you know have like a you know minimal inventory and uh, a little bit of room to grow. There is no any uh, planning of making noises or make doing any repair job at that location or anything like that. So, and also, I'm also open to any condition that you guys might put in place in order to give me this opportunity. So I uh, thank you for hearing. <clears throat> thank you for hearing me. So uh, I'd be more than happy to answer any question. Questions for the applicant? Yes, ma'am. Uh, Commissioner Warren. Yeah, do you have any other uh, car lots that you're mar marketing with in Wichita? No, uh, I mean, I work as a car salesman for the past three years. You know, that will allow me to gain experience in car selling. I bought this uh, this property to kind of like, you know, uh, start my actually very first one. Thank you. And Other questions for the applicant? Uh, anyone participating virtually who would like to speak on this item? Hearing none, I'll bring it back to discussion of the commission. I'm kind of uh, in favor of 
uh, approving this um, request, there's not going to be any mechanical work being done. It's just strictly going to be car sales. Any mechanical work that he's going to have done is going to be done off site. Um, I car lots like this are really low impact. Uh, may not people may not like them for some reason or another, but they're. It's not like it's going to be a, a heavily pop uh, heavily uh, uh, populated, I guess, um, business that's going to have a lot of traffic in and out. So I would move to approve. And I would uh, use the uh, conditions that are listed in the um, agenda. I'll second the motion. We have a motion to approve from Mr. Green, second from Commissioner Nix. Um, discussion. Eric, I got a question. Is there anything in that meeting other than the fact that they don't like cars? Not, not here. Like, like, it, 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 the question was, was there anything specific at the DAB during their conversation about why they recommended denial versus approval? And I can tell you that um, they went, it was quite a discussion. Um, they talked about the ability for someone to open a small scale business and have a viable business. On the flip side, the other thing that they talked about was the location um, the, how a car lot would fit within the context of the residential in close proximity. Um, they also mentioned and talked about the uh, automotive nature of what's already on the corner with the repair shop. But uh, then again, talking about extending that further north, I think was one of the things, just, just given the context and how it abuts the residential that's already developed nearby was, I think, the issue. Commissioner Duell. Um, was uh, the applicant at the DAB meeting? Uh, no, he was, he was not, sir. He followed the wrong link. Do you know how long the building there has been vacant with no occupant? The area that was that is being requested for the rezone was previously occupied with a multifamily. I think it, probably a duplex um, that was recently raised, but I do not know when this structure was um, originally built. Thank you, I Commissioner think, Williams Bay. Yeah, I think that used to be a secondhand clothing store. Uh, okay, got it. That hillside's a tough one in that area. It really is. A car lot next to an automotive shop is not a bad buffer between residential. And that's all I got to say about that. <laughs> I I second the motion only because it's five cars. I mean, I, it that do, doesn't seem like. Uh, I mean, I know it's a business, but it doesn't seem like an overly used business. Yeah. And. Has the applicant agreed to the five car situation as a starting point? The applicant has stated to me, um, as well as during his presentation, that he is on board with all of the staff's recommended conditions. Okay. Um, I'm going to call the question then. Uh, all in favor of approving the motion. And do we need to have more specifics about how this meets the criteria? I think that would be beneficial. The interpretation that I've heard so far is that the conditions that are, if, if I'm interpreting this correctly, that the conditions that are listed in the staff report under approval help to mitigate it and help it to fit more appropriately into the context of the surrounding area. Okay. All right. All in favor of approving the motion, please say by, uh, indicate by saying aye. Aye. Uh, aye. aye. Any opposed, same sign. One opposition. Motion passes nine to one. 
Next case, 4.12, zoning 2022-00048. Um, presentation by Philip. Go ahead, please. Yes. Uh, Paul, can you go to the zoning map first? Thank you. Um, this is a request to amend a community unit plan, DP192, located on the east side of Webb Road, south of 29th Street, kind of in the crook here of K96 as it traverses southeast. The property is currently developed with a medical office. If you're familiar with the area, there is medical offices everywhere. Um, what's interesting is B zoning is the first zoning classification that allows a medical use. Um, including a medical office. The request for the rezone and the community unit plan amendment is to go to GO general office zoning to use the existing building as a general office instead of a medical office. And so effectively, an office use is not really going to really change the character of the area. Um, it's just that the underlying zoning of B does not allow a general use or general office as a use. Um, but it does allow a medical office. So when you consider the um, type of traffic or the type of hours of operation or, you know, influx of users onto the site will likely not change. Um, it just won't be medical in nature. It'll just be general office in nature um, instead. Uh, so I'm going to keep it pretty brief because that's just the general um, thing. We have not heard any um, opposition to this case up to this point. It does not go to DAB until next week, so we don't have any insight from them. Um, I will just state that it is in conformance with a comprehensive plan. Um, and staff is recommending approval sub to the conditions. Um, uh, condition one, allow office is defined by the uh, Unified Zoning Code only on parcel five, which is what is highlighted on the screen. Um, and then all the other um, requirements of the CUP are in place and that they have to provide the required drawings if this case is approved within a certain amount of time. Um, I guess I can go through the site pictures uh, real quick if you want to jump to those, Paul. So this is looking at the site um, from across the street. Again, currently a, a medical office. Next picture. This is looking north of the site at a, another medical type facility. Uh, next picture. This is looking north of the site. There's um, other construction in the area of office natures and uses, likely medical or otherwise. Next picture. Um, kind of a closer view of what we just saw. Next picture. This is looking to the east of the site. This is again another medical office. Directly budding to the site to the east is undeveloped. Next picture. To the southeast and to the south, there are residential uses, but you have the wall, which is required by the community plan. You have existing vegetation. Again, the existing use on the site is a medical office with parking. They're just changing the use inside the building. Um, and staff felt that in general of whether it's general office use or medical office use, it really was not going to have any impact on the surrounding residential. Next picture. A little bit closer view of those residential. This is the end of the parking lot of the use. You can see the parking lot does extend a little bit farther. But again, this is not changing. They're already used, these residences already have that this type of a use. It's just what is happening inside the building versus anything that's going on outside the building. And with that, I can stand for any questions. Questions for staff? Applicant or agent? You've been waiting for this moment, what feels like all your life, haven't you? been a while. Phil Meyer with Boffman Company, agent for the applicant. I think Philip did a great job of spelling that out. This is via Christie repurposing an existing building for their administrative staff and office isn't allowed in B zoning. So we're looking to adjust that. With that, I'll answer any questions you may have. Any questions for Phil? Then I'll call for public comment. Anyone participating virtually who'd like to speak on this item? Do we remember who asked? Okay. Madam Chair, just for the record. I had the call in because I kicked this ball off at six o'clock. 
would you, for the record, to say that there's nobody in the public in the, so that way We're, if it comes up on the transcript, okay. it'll be evident. At this point, we have no one from the public present to speak on this item, so I'll bring it back to the uh, commission for a uh, discussion or a motion. Move to approve for staff comments. Mo second. Motion to approve per staff comments from Commissioner Johnson, second from Commissioner Green. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. Hearing none, motion passes 9-0. Item 4.13, zoning case 2022-00049. Erin? Erin McFriend with the Planning Department. Um, the applicant for this case is requesting a zone change from SF5, uh, I'm sorry, SF20, single family residential to TF3, two family residential for a 58 acre unplotted property located um, a quarter mile north of East 39th Street South and on the east side of South Rock Road. The property is located in unincorporated Cedric County. Um, and the contract buyer intends to raise the existing sam there is a single family residence currently on the site. The contract buyer intends to raise this residence um, and develop approximately 108 duplexes um, with 216 dwelling units on the site. Um, Paul, if we could go to the preliminary layout on that, please. Um, so you'll see here, this is a a draft sketch um, and, and could potentially be subject to change, but this is what has been presented um, currently. The, should this request be approved, um, it is anticipated that the contract buyer will petition the city of Wichita for island annexation of the property. Um, the city limits of Wichita are within 350 feet north of the subject site. And um, this type of annexation would require a resolution to be adopted by the Wichita City Council and then final approval by the uh, Central County Board of County Commissioners. Um, and staff is recommending that if the zoning request is approved for the site, that um, publication of the ordinance, which um, would uh, perfect the zoning would be delayed until the annexation is considered. We have done this through um, the addition of um, a protective overlay as a um, condition to the approval and the, the only text of the protective overlay is um, to state that um, the publication of the zoning ordinance would not um, occur until the site had been annexed into the city of Wichita. Um, if we go to the uh, zoning map, please. You'll see property to the north is zoned SF20, single family residential. Um, and the directly abutting property is developed as single family residence. Continuing north are the Rock Ford Edition, um, which is zoned LC and limited commercial district and developed with duplexes and the Rocky Ford second edition, which is zone TF3 um, and PUD and is developed with single family residences. Um, the property at the south of the subject site is approximately 75 acres in size and is zoned uh, SF20 single family residential with the exception of a seven acre parcel zoned LC um, at the uh, intersection of Rock and East 39th Street. The property east of the subject site is also zoned SF20 single family and is used for agricultural purposes. And then um, you'll see here to the west of the site, this is the Air Force Base in that, that dark color. The site has not been platted um, and a request for annexation of this property into the city, which has not been filed at the time of the staff report. There have been no other zoning actions on the site. Um, the site will have access to Rock Road and municipal sewer and water are currently available serving the Rocky Ford addition to the north, approximately 350 foot away. Um, those potentially could be extended south to serve the site, um, but ultimately that would be determined during the plotting process whether or not those lines had that capacity. Um, the request to rezone the property is in, found to be in conformance with the adopted um, plans and policies. And with that, I will stand, or I'm sorry, I'll go to photos. The 
This is the single family residence currently on located on the subject site to be raised should the application be approved. Next photo, please. Um, subject site facing east. Next photo, please. This is the Rocky Ford um, subdivision to the north of the site. Next photo, please. It's an SF20 property north of the subject site. And then you can see the Air Force Base um, across uh, Rock Road there. You can kind of see the, um, that property. Next photo, please. Okay. With that, I'm happy to stand for any questions. Questions? Hearing none, applicant. Afternoon, Phil Meyer, Boffman Company, agent for the applicant. Um, this basis basically is going to be an extension of the Rocky Ford development that is to the north. There is sanitary sewer and water available to serve the property. Uh, once, if the zoning is approved and the contract is completed, then we will request annexation to the city and start the planning process. Um, this uh, best thing I can tell you is just going to be extension of the Rocky Ford. So if you look at that, that's what we're going to do down here. With that, I'll answer any questions you may have. Questions for the applicant? Commissioner Warren. Phil, uh, with uh, Rocky Ford, they did first four cul-de-sacs for the duplexes, and the rest of it went single family. Yes. Are they thinking something similar to that with this one, that, they'll, that the properties I think up against, against Rock, Rock Road will, will be multifamily and then, and then blend into single family? I think there's going to be a combination of both. Yes, I can't give you the specific. This part's going to be this many duplex, this many single family, because that's not been determined yet. But with 58 acres, it's going to be a combination of both. I know that a lot of these, a lot of the questions that I have right now will be uh, answered at the time of platting. Uh, but um, do, does the owner of this property also own that property to the north? You, when you uh, indicated that it was going to be an extension of Rocky, Rocky Ford, it would, to me, that would indicate that there would be some kind of a connection point there. Yeah. So, no, this is the same developer as the developer of Rocky Ford, um, and there will there are two parcels between Rocky Ford and this property that are not under contract or are still owned by the present land owner. So uh, if I misled you, it's not a direct expansion. It's the same developer. It's the same product. It's the same <coughs> style development that we're going to do there. There will not be an internal link, but we will provide opportunities for that. Okay, thanks. Any other questions from the commission? Hearing none, I would call for public comment. Uh, are there any members of the public virtual who would like to speak on this item? Yes, there is. Okay, please <laughs> state your name and address and you will have three minutes. My name is Richard Lyons. I live at 425 North Madison. I am, I used to live there out on the farm. It is my property with my older sister and younger brother. <clears throat> um, we've been there since 77. We were raised there. And it is a farm property. We rent out our back acres to a farmer. Now, if you change the whatever he wants wants done, that's going to increase our, our our taxes on the house and on the property. Now, if the developer was decent enough to give us a decent price for the property, we'd be happy to sell. But he's not. We're up in age, and we just can't get rid of it to put to fatten his pockets. Now, you got any questions for me? 
Yes, uh, questions for the speaker, Ms. Commissioner Warren? Yeah, I, I think that one of the things you'll find is that your property is going to be taxed based on how it is used. So if you continue to farm it, it will continue to be taxed as farmed. Yeah, you won't pick up the, the aspect of development and, and have uh, land prices that goes, goes for housing uh, until you turn that property into a development and start selling those lots. As long as you're farming it, the taxes are going to be is based on how the, how the, the property is used, not what its potential is. Any other questions for the speaker? Again, thank you for bearing with our time frame to be present to speak on this item. Um, any other persons participating virtually who would like to speak on this item? This is Commissioner Blick. Um, at 6 o'clock, I got kicked off. And I don't know if there's anybody else that's on virtually besides calling in. I was only able to call in because it said it was closed. And so I was okay. able to get in for the last two votes. Um, that was in, but I just want to let them know. And then I can actually mute it on my side because whenever you open and close, I'm not able to speak and they close it out for public. So I can actually mute it on my side. So if you can leave me unmuted. Okay, thank you for checking in with us, Commissioner Blick. I would, this is Scott Wadle. I would just report that we show uh, that there's 13 members who are members of the public or individuals who are joined into the meeting right okay. now. So I appreciate the heads up and we'll follow up with our, our tech folks. Okay. Um, any other persons participating virtual who would like to speak on this item? Hearing none, we'll bring this back to the commission. Oh, rebuttal. Uh, uh, any further comments? The applicant declines to use the rebuttal. So returning to the commission. Move we approve uh, per staff comment. A motion to approve from Commissioner Green, second from Commissioner Duell. Any further discussion? I'd call for a vote. All in favor, indicate by aye. 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 Any opposed? Same uh, nay. Hearing none. Same no, I'm sorry. Um, that we now have nine persons present. Is that accurate? Motion passes 9-0. And the next step will be then an application for annexation. Uh, next item, 4.15, 4.14, I'm really always optimistic, uh, zoning case 2022-00050, uh, I'll have the staff, yes. Madam Chair, sorry, uh, but w one quick comment, I don't know that the agent is here for this case, they were earlier. Uh, we checked, is the agent? Yes, actually, um, uh, this is Michael Edwards with KU Miller Engineering, um, agent for the applicant. Yeah. I am online. Great. Thank you so much. Go ahead, Christine, with the staff report. Good, good evening, everyone. Christina Reith, Associate Planner. Uh, the applicant is uh, NNT Investments, LLC, and the agent is KE Miller Engineering. The applicant is requesting a zone change from SF5, single family residential district, to TF3, two family residential district. The property is generally located on the east side of South Greenwich Road within one quarter mile south of East Harry Street. The property is currently undeveloped and the applicant proposes to build duplexes on site. The development of the subject site is, is a portion of the larger housing development and um, let's see, I'm gonna move my mouse here. So it's part of this larger housing development here and uh, the remainder of the de development will have single family residential dwellings. So uh, Paul, could you please go to the site plan? Or maybe, it, maybe it's not included. Oh, well, according to the submitted site plan, the applicant proposes to construct five roads and 31 lots for duplexes. Um, if we look at this aerial here, um, 
within one quarter mile northeast of the subject property off uh, East Harry Street, there is TF3, two family zoning, residential district zoning. Thus, uh, duplexes are not a new use being introduced into the area. So based on the uh, information that was presented to us at the time, we are requesting approval of this application because uh, the requested zoning aligns with the goals of the community investments plan. Uh, the property uh, is located within the new residential and new residential employment mix areas of the 2035 Wichita Future Growth Concept Map. So it says uh, it, in, it entails areas of land that will likely be developed or redeveloped by 2035 with uses predominantly of mixed nature. And I want to emphasize that due to the proximity of higher intensity business uses, residential housing types within this area will likely be of higher density. So duplexes bring that diversity to residential de developments typically found in a large urban municipality as well as a higher density to a new residential area. Based upon the information that available at the time the staff report was completed, staff recommends approval of the zone change request. And with that, I will open up for questions. Questions for staff. Oh, I forgot to mention, I have not, met, I have not received any feedback regarding this case. Thank and the you. DAB has not happened. <laughs> okay. The DAB's uh, coming Monday. up next week. Yep. OK. Applicant or agent, would you uh, speak on this topic, please? Uh, yeah, uh, again, Michael Edwards, uh, KE Miller Engineering, 117 East Lewis, uh, agent for the applicant. Um, we agree with staff comments and uh, any questions? Any questions for the applicant? Now I would ask if there's any members of the public who would like to speak on this item. Please state your name and address for the record. It's Douglas Mackay, 2002 South Greenwich Road. Thank you, Douglas. You have three minutes. Please proceed with your Thank comments. You. Well, it's difficult because the timer is no longer available. So, uh, with that, I've lived in that 2002 since uh, 2005. And what the staff has not pointed out is all the big houses and lots south of this location. And the allegation that there's somehow duplexes somewhere close to here, there might be one or two, but there is certainly not a bunch of duplexes. The duplexes are down on Webb and Harry, and in that area where the Dillons is, the, the Walmart, not Walmart, Q-Trip, and the CVS. This is a change in the uh, planning here. All these homes you can see here are single family homes. The church that sits just north of this is uh, sold this property. And to put in five rows of duplex is basically putting in a bunch of uh, high density housing in an area that's not high density. It's not for high density purposes. The school that serves this southeast has already said we got too many students here. So here we are wanting to build more duplexes to house more people to go to those schools. And duplexes are transitory in nature. The additional traffic, this is a two-lane road with a center lane. It's already overcrowded, and they just rebuilt that three or four years ago. And why there's not been any opposition, I wonder if somebody's asked that question, because the sign stood up for maybe one day and then was knocked down by the wind because they put it up with two pieces of wood that were not fit for the job. So that's why there's no opposition. Unless you lived there, you didn't see it. So I speak in opposition to this because it's not the best use for this property. I own 30 acres right there, 10 of which butts up against the property they bought. You can see the waterway that runs through here. What I would suggest is they have not established this group it's not any of these big developments. This is somebody who's come in and bought 28 acres and thinks they're going to squeeze on 32 plus duplexes on this piece of property. That is not the best use of this land. So there is no change in circumstances. It might be consistent with a plan two miles to the east 
or two miles to the west. But Clark Bastion's son just bought that property up on the corner there, 74 acres. And he probably didn't see the sign and he probably didn't get a letter. So that is my opposition. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for the speaker? Okay. Hearing none. Are there any other persons present who would like to speak on this item? A persons virtual. Hearing none, I will bring it back to the commission. Uh, we have re opportunity for rebuttal by the uh, applicant. Um, the only thing that I would like to maybe add, um, it does list on the um, on the report that it's 31 lots, and I'm looking at the proposed site plan. I don't know if the site plan was provided. It's in the report, um, but I, I was only counting 20 lots. I know that's not a large difference, but I just wanted to note that I believe our site plan has 20 lots that are being um, requested instead of 31. But other than that, um, no more comment. Okay. Now returning to the commission. Well, we run into this every time somebody wants to go to a multifamily. Uh, the most of our neighborhoods are going to to mixed use, where you got you got some single family, some large, some smaller, some duplex, and in some cases even some apartments will, will find its way from time to time. That seems to be the way to go, uh, and also. That is what the market is demanding right now because of cost of housing. Single family housing is really hurting uh, because it's just so expensive. And if we're going to provide housing for people, then multifamily is going to have to be the way to go. So I would move to approve as presented. We have a motion to approve. Second from Commissioner Foster. Um, second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? I think what I see is there's definitely a buffer between the larger estates and the church, and that seems like an appropriate progression toward the um, uh, for a good location for duplexes to meet the need for housing. Um, any other discussion? Well, otherwise, I'd call for a vote. All those in favor of the motion, aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. Hearing none. The motion passes uh, nine to zero. Mr. Stephen Banks spends the majority of his life planning for the future of our community. And he is here after many hours of work on the comprehensive plan. Uh, the advanced plan committee has heard uh, Mr. Banks' detailed presentations over the past three to four meetings uh, that we've had over the past few months. And I want to first commend him for his work and his career, which has been putting forth the documents that you've had the opportunity to look at. And with that, Mr. Banks, uh, we would entertain your motion for the action of this body. Yes. Uh, next slide. Uh, we are actually, actually asking you to set up public hearings for November 3rd, 2022 to update the community investments plan. Next slide. We've done uh, population forecasts looking at trends and uh, growth capacity, and we are recommending uh, a growth scenario that will extend uh, the comprehensive plan out to 2045 with the same population we projected for 2035. Next slide. We are also updating the uh, land use layer of the growth concept map to reflect the last 10 years of growth. And we're doing some very slight modifications to the growth areas, which I've detailed a little bit more uh, in the staff report. Uh, altogether, uh, they are like 99.75, the same area as uh, the existing comprehensive plan. So we'll be accommodating the same population. Uh, next slide. We are also 
proposing some changes to the symbology of the growth areas to make it easier to see the underlying land use with the uh, zoning case maps that you get. Next slide. We've asked uh, City Finance to uh, update their uh, CIP projections out to the year 2045. And we also find with that that we'll be able to close the gap in the uh, community investments plan a little bit by that. Next slide. If you approve the uh, hearing for November 3rd, we will be going out to the dabs and cabs during November with the aim of going to Wichita City Council on November 22nd and the Board of County Commission on December 7th. And my retirement will be the 5th of December. <laughs> Next slide. So any thoughts or questions? Stephen, the succinct nature of your report reflects the superb level of preparation that you made for this. That was excellent. Okay. Um, we need a motion. I move that we take the recommended action. Second. We have a motion. Commissioner Green is second from Commissioner Foster. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you all for your stellar participation through a long day. Staff, for an even longer day. We appreciate you greatly. Stephen, we're going to get you retired. Yeah. <laughs> but not yet. Not yet. And I hope we can all...